Welcome everybody to the Mind Your Own Business with DJB podcast. I got a special guest with me today, Paul Stewart himself. In the building. Can you please tell everybody who's tuning in who you are and what you do? Uh, well, I do many things. I go by many names. Uh, Paul Stewart, a.k.a. DJP. Uh, I'm from uh, also the white boy from Crenshaw, my newest moniker. Uh, I'm a ex-DJ, music manager, record label owner, music supervisor. Mm-hmm. I've been, um, I discovered a bunch of big rappers back in the, the 90s, the golden era. Uh, I've been music supervising films and TV since Poetic Justice. That's beautiful. Yeah, all the way up to current. I'm working on Snowfall and um, just the show for HBO Max, The Hype. That's hard. My relationship with Paul, we formally met on the set of Insecure season one, right? And we kind of we kind of bonded over DJing. Yes. Like our 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 conversation commonality evolved over DJing. And he was like, yeah, you know, I'm DJ P. I I. I, I don't really get down that much on a turntable like that, but I see you over here. I see you over there mixing in between takes and shit. That was um, season one, episode one of Insecure, right? Yeah, you've been my favorite DJ in LA for a while. Hey, say that. Up until right now, there's a new DJ that just, you know, I think just took your spot. What's her name? Jelly P, man. She's blowing up Lamert Park. She DJ for Common at his uh, concert he did in Lamert Park the other day. She's on fire. But uh, yeah, I knew, I knew, but, it, I knew it had to be a girl. <laughs> it had to be a girl for you to it. say such it's, blasphemies. It's, <laughs> <laughs> no, you've been my favorite DJ in LA for a long time. So I, I, I appreciate your um, your DJ skills and your and your selection, and I think you're dope. No, I appreciate you. You, Paul, you just always been there. Like you know what I mean. Ever since I met you, you've been there, and you've been consistently you. Ever since, ever since I met you, day one, like. Tried, you know what's interesting? I feel like you get that a lot. Like I, I um like I feel like after people talk to you, they don't really question your um the genuine authenticity. Yeah, yeah, your authenticity, right, right? Right, right, right. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I mean, um I'm never trying to be something that I'm not, you know. It's funny like when I came up with the name White Boy from Crenshaw, it was funny mm-hmm. cuz when I was a kid, I was riding around on a skateboard here, which was not cool. You know, I You brought I, skateboards to the hood? Yeah, I was kind of one of the first, you know, and um, I was early, you know, my brother influenced me. He was listening to a lot of rock music. And so before the hood kind of took me under mm. and I started hanging out with cats that lived over here, like by uh, Buddha Market and, and and right right around the corner from here, you know, yeah. Slauson and uh, uh, um, undisclosed location in the hood. Sorry. But um, <laughs> um, I was on some real white boy shit, you nice. know, but but living over here and then and then the the neighborhood just started to influence me more. You know uh, I mean? But but my point being that I never tried to be something that I wasn't, right? You know what I mean? Or I, I'd like to believe. Right. I don't really get accused of that much. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's Danny. So. Oh, that's Danny, yeah. I like, no, I, I forgot that I did change my name to, oh, that's Danny, not, oh, that's just Danny. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> oh, you forgot the just. The just too, nigga. <laughs> don't, fuck, don't fuck up my moniker. Thank you. Okay, yo, Are we these niggas, yeah, we filming, but nah, they, it's cool. That, that's 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 okay. good. That's quality content right there. These niggas be behind the camera telling me all kind of sh- mimes and shit. They be like, <laughs> <laughs> they're really just like. I was like. Put, my, talking head, about put set, my head down, put, nigga. What, it, throw the what, weeds what so in the fuck the are you saying? Like, <laughs> they have no useful information. Dog, they, we need a fucking teleprompter or something. That would be far. Hey, I actually just got a TV stand, like where you could put a TV on a stand. So like we can like have a TV on a, st- it's a portable too. You can put the TV on a stand and we can have a, a a teleprompter so that you can talk to me. So that you don't have to, yeah, that that's rolling. <laughs> <laughs> roll on the blunt, roll fast. Right, for sure. Hey, you want to talk about your beefs though? Nah. Nah, you don't want to talk about your beefs? I'm all about love and peace, man. You know, I'm about trying to get back to the community and stuff. I mean, you can ask me a specific question. I'll answer right. anything you say. No, nah, I get it. But have, I, have you I, heard? I don't, I don't like him. I, I have very few beefs in the industry. In fact, I'm pretty much like universally don't have beef with people. I, that's my thing. I roll around everywhere. No problem with people because I don't have beefs. Right. 
Yeah, that's there's a couple of industry people that you know I've I've fallen out with or whatever, but you know, they're corn balls. You know, when I say exploiters of the culture, and you know, I just want to yeah, I wanted it because. I did. I was doing. I was like, "Oh shit, Paul's coming." Yeah. Let me make sure I got some shit to talk about. Yeah. So I was looking up the videos on YouTube yeah. of of other interviews or podcasts that you've done, mm-hmm. and you was just like, "I I don't fuck with Vlad. I don't fuck with I don't fuck with academics." Mm. And and it's because of what you just said. They're culture vultures, right? Or yeah, no? yeah, yeah. I, I got kind of an issue with people that are profiting off of um, you know um, perpetuating this like. Uh, uh, narrative that's helping people get arrested that's you know um vlad is notorious for getting people arrested that's just a negative like overall negative like like vlad has some like hip-hop history interviews that i think are great i can't take everything away from him i used to watch a lot of academic videos but that whole like that whole like chicago scorecard thing and everything he was doing like if you think about it like he made a lot of money off of the talking about all that pain from all those mm-hmm. killings and kind of like a, almost like joking way. So I, I just think that's a little uh, 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 greasy. Vic Mensa, Vic Mensa called him out said yeah. he wanted to beat his ass. Yeah, I think it was a little greasy, you know, and I think I think that all that like um, encouraging dudes to come on there and kind of self-snitch by mm-hmm. the questions you asked that Vlad does is greasy. But, you know, I know Vlad from back in the day. Um, I ain't got no real beef with him, but, you know, Right. Wait. But if you ask me how I feel, that's how I feel. Right. I get it. Yeah. Like, yeah, I ain't got no problem with yeah. him, the person, no, but right, like right. what he does is, yeah. it's a vulture to the culture for yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, um, I only met academics once, so I don't know him or anything. Oh, okay. Tell me about White Boy on Crenshaw. You self proclaimed moniker, right? Yeah, I came up with that sitting at Haroon Coffee in the Merck <laughs> Park in Crenshaw. Let me see that lighter. Oh, that easy. Lighter. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, um, we were working on a trailer about my life. Okay. And um, I thought that that title would be provocative. I clicked it. Right. I right. felt for the bait. If people I see that, they're going to want to do it. And, and it's very true. It's completely true. Mm-hmm. Uh, born and raised, um, you know, lived my whole life in, 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 in Crenshaw area until I moved and went to college and have been back in the area for a while. Where did you so. go to college? Was it in the Bay? You used to go to college in the yeah, Bay? Yeah, I went to Sonoma State. It's like a Santa Rosa, about an hour north of uh, Oakland and San Francisco. So oh, okay. I would dip down to, to San Francisco and Oakland and buy records and because that's when I started DJing. Mm-hmm. I, I was hearing a lot of your stories and you was talking mm-hmm. about how, like when I heard people you were interacting with, when you started DJing and stuff, when you did the the pause the pause tapes and shit for your oh, parties, shit. people don't even know about pause tapes. You know, it's interesting. I had to look up what pause tapes were. I didn't even know what that was until 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 you said it. It's basically like when you didn't have two turntables right. and you still wanted songs to play at a whole party, you would play a song on the tape and then play a song on the record and then go back to the tape. You'll go back and forth between tape right, and record. Right. Well, no, no. What I do is you make a tape, right? And so it's like, so you play the song, you're recording a cassette from vinyl. When the song is just ending, you pause it. Then you drop in the, then you start the next oh, record. Oh, so then at the party, you're only playing the tape. But the tape keeps playing songs. First party ever I did, I made that tape. I had a turntable because when you got to flip the tape, it's going to be this long ass uh, dead air. So I played a record on my turntable turn when I flipped the tape. The that tape... was the first party I ever did. It was a pause tape and one turntable only to play records when I flipped the tape. So a pause tape evolution, evolution, evolved into well, mixtapes. Motherfuckers did pause tapes too, like <laughs> on some serious, like, like K Day Mixmasters were using like eight tracks and everything, and they were kind of like doing it in a different way. But you mm-hmm. know, so there's different kind of like when people say pause, they could mean something that's more sophisticated, where they're like you know mixing from different things or whatever. But I was just playing a record, trying to catch like right at the end, and then and drop the next, get the record right before it would start, so it would be a continuous blend of music more or less. You know, it wasn't mixed or anything. Right. You know. I- I, it was rudimentary. I mean, it was like... I got the job for, done in right, 80, got the, it got the job done in 84. That was probably 83. 82, 83. So, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the fact that, um, you know, we were playing, you know, uh, cool music, people were loving it. Yeah, that's what I... And then I started... The dances and stuff I started doing at school became really popular because we were, like, the first people playing hip-hop. Mm. Was, what was you playing? Well, what, what? Sugar Hill Gang type shit? Rapper's Delight? 
Houdini, Fat Boys, hey. definitely Sugar Hill Gang, Rapper's Delight, Curtis Blow, uh, Christmas Rapping. Uh, did your DJ career? Did your DJ career make it to um, computers? Yeah, I did it with Serato. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah, I went all the way from there to Serato, man. Right. They used the, yeah. there through the whole and, evolution. And, 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 of and it. I'm a big proponent of Serato. People that hate on Serato don't understand the art of DJing. Like, like, I mean, look. I really I, don't understand those. I see them on Twitter. Yeah, yeah. I was like, I don't even get them. And then, don't get me started. Have it, you heard of You um, could only do, if you're a good DJ, you can only just do more with Serato. Fact. You know, I mean, the only argument for vinyl is that the sonic quality is better. But that's not enough for lugging them crates. Anyone that lugged them crates like I did, no, man, you know. And when I seen DJ Premier with Serato, I was like, yeah, it's a wrap. <laughs> yeah, that was like 15 years ago or some crazy shit. You right, know, so, like yeah, yeah. 25. Probably. Right, because yeah. uh, like, uh, Serato was like 99. Yeah, but he didn't jump right on it. No, nobody did. Yeah, yeah. Nobody did. It was, it was a trial and error for that. I remember. I remember when I made. Well, it was real goofy at first too. I mean, it was very. It was dangerous when you had Serato at first because that shit would like tweak out on you at the party. Yeah, and you then, can, like, then you what can... do you do? You had to bring vinyl too. It came out in '99. You almost had to bring vinyl too, like you would DJ. You know, it came out in '99. I say nobody was like actually like fully trusting it till like '04. You know, I owe everything to DJ, and I was thinking about it yesterday because the probably the most important person I met in my career was John Singleton, right? Mm -hmm. And I met him when I was DJing. Oh yeah, you were doing a party, he came up to you? It was a TV show. I was DJing for the studio audience of um a show called Out All Night, Patty LaBelle's show. That's hard. Rebecca <laughs> Fox was on it or something. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, he came up to me and he liked what I was playing. And we started talking and then he found out I worked for Ice Cube. At that time I worked for Ice Cube Street Knowledge was right here in the hood. Right around the corner in the in, in the sixties. And uh I worked for Cube at Street Knowledge and that was obviously like John was like, you know, that was his dude, you know, Cube yeah. was his dude. And um and then I was managing the far side and, and that impressed me like the far side. So that that opened the conversation and then um I invited him to this showcase I was doing at the Roxy. Yeah. Do we see the Roxy? It's the Roxy. It was the Roxy. And then what happened? <laughs> no, that's he came. Oh, it was dope. He came, was sold out. Big boy from you know the radio was the MC. We had like this group, the Wascals, was the baby far side. I think Coolio had some of his groups performing. And uh well Coolio wasn't even out yet, but he was signed. And mm -hmm. then um and John came up to me and he was like, This is dope. You put this on. I was like, Yeah, and he's like, I want you to run my label and music supervise my next movie. Which was Poetic Justice with, Damn. with Tupac and Janet Jackson. You had some great timing and getting the game. Ooh. Shit, legendary status for sure. That's definitely That was wonderful sure. timing. Yeah. I didn't know you managed Farside. What's your yeah, man? All right, what's your... most, that's the thing I'm most one thing I'm most famous for, yeah. Hell I discovered nah. the far side. Yeah, yeah. Fuck uh, no. There was a DJ <laughs> and Paul was his name. Marcel it's George. Easily your biggest claim to well, fame. Well, I'm on the record. I'm in the record. Yeah, right, yeah. Right, he called right. you. I was like, like whenever I, whenever I talk about Paul, they be like, "Who's Paul? You ever heard the song by Montel Jordan? This is how we do it. There was a DJ, and Paul was his name. This is Paul. That's what I always tell everybody whenever I talk about you. Yeah, I made sure we put that in my trailer. And I, I if I, I found somebody to find me, like I should have had you do it, but like you know, loop it a few times. Like, let me hear my name a couple times. Back Facts. Back. You know what I'm saying? Like, Facts. You know, that's that's how... like a drop. You know? Fact. <laughs> and if you got the acapella, I might have the acapella mm, today. Come on, DJ B, it's, make it's... that make that for me. You need, I need that. You the, need, I need that, that, that drop. proper. Yeah. That, 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 that button. You need that button. Just on command. So maybe an air horn or Actually, something. Actually, I got know, a, like, I got a, know. I got an app on my phone that does sound effects too. I, I'll pitch it to you. DJ B, you might go back on my list as the, my number one LA DJ. Oh, you know, yay. You know. From two to one. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> now, that's dope. But to kind of like backtrack a little bit. Sure. What, what got you into hip hop? Like, when did you fall in love with hip hop? Uh, Man, well, you know, when I, when, I was, when I was in high school, I just started hearing it. Like, when I was a senior, I started hearing shit like Rapper's Delight. And, and, and I remember I heard uh, Herbie Hancock rock it. Like, you know, you yeah. know this record with the DJing and everything. And... Um, and uh, I just kind of was like trans. I was just transfixed by it. You know what I mean? And then, uh, and then I went away to school and I just started DJing. And so, it, you know, we didn't. I didn't play exclusively hip hop, but it was a big part always of of the set. You know, I was playing a lot of new wave music. Madonna was coming out. Michael mm. Jackson 
was putting out fucking Thriller and shit. I was DJing when Thriller came out, when Madonna's first album came out. I was playing a lot of, you know, New Wave was popping. Yeah. So, but we played a lot of hip hop. Hey, so as a DJ, what was it like going into the transition of rap music with cussing? Was that a comfortable transition for you? I know a lot of people was not fucking with cussing in music at parties at the beginning. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, you couldn't play. I mean, like, I remember when we got the NWA 12-inch, like, um, 8-Ball and Posse or whatever. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like, we, weren't, we were listening to that at our crib, but we weren't playing that kind of shit at no parties or nothing like that. No, I know, we so then, like, what happened? Because somebody started playing it at parties, well, and know, it started going up. Well, actually, you know what? Fuck that, man. We were playing Luke shit at our party. We were getting yeah, turned. What are you talking about? We were playing Throw That P. We were playing nasty about, shit. No, I'm talking about, talking about, shit. No, I'm talking about the, because right you were DJing then. in the 80s. Yeah. So Luke wasn't yet. So I'm talking about that transition before Luke yeah, was. Well, when did Luke, hey, Google, <laughs> Google Luke's first records. It wasn't in the 80s. Yeah. It had to have been. No, it I was playing it at college. You couldn't have been. Yes. 83 to 88 is when I was DJing in college and we were playing throw that P. Uh, I remember the I remember playing it at I remember where I was playing it at. Where were you? <laughs> what am I lying? We're not what that. <laughs> we weren't there. We <laughs> he says he remembers. What the fuck? I was in Santa Rosa. I was I was, you know, we were DJing at little like uh pizza parlors and mm-hmm. we were DJing at uh uh Oh, well. <laughs> Don't don't doubt me, man. <laughs> I'm gonna just keep quoting. Literally, I'm gonna quote. Ra- I'm gonna quote rap lyrics. <laughs> Wait, mask on, mask off. Okay, I know about rap. Okay, I'm gonna yeah. I'm I'm quote rap lyrics. So. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, we right. were playing in cars. We were playing. I, what you're saying is true. Like there were certainly like things where like that was, but it was it was it was. It, I don't know. I don't know when that was. Look, honestly, I, I was in the Bay Area, and it was like up there. There's a lot of like. Mexicans and Filipinos and they like that high techno music and they mixed it with the Luke music and they like that Miami music. Damn. We were playing that Miami music and that fashion we were, and we were playing like um, the point of no return, like expose. We were playing like dance music and we're, <laughs> and we're mixing it with like, you know, fast stuff like throw that D, throw that D, you know. That's all right. And then, so you had, you had early access to all the early too short and shit then, huh? Yeah, you were, yeah, you were I, I, yeah, I was buying those 12 inches of Too Short uh, on... Um, was the hype really real? Were, were people, like, traveling to go get Too Short mixtapes that he was selling out of his trunk? Like, were people traveling near and far? I believe it, but, like, in Santa Rosa where I was, it was... It, we were we were a little bit more on some, like, B-boy shit and dance shit. I remember when Hammer came out, we were all, like, playing his <laughs> early 12 inches and everything. We were all on Hammer. I had, we had the, we bought like the too short and we had it, but most of his stuff was too slow for like DJs really or whatever. Mm. Though he had a few things. It was more underground. It was just more underground, you know? Yeah. I didn't feel it like that where I was. Oh, okay. It was, but but he, I was he buying was, the records and yeah. it was, yeah, he was, it was popping. For sure. Certainly possible. I don't want to, you know. Right. I and mean, you weren't in Oakland, so. No. Like, it was, I, it was in the suburbs. Like, right. I was like in Orange County or something. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I wasn't even there. And you know what I seen on, um, Twitter, people are really hot about. They're yeah. com- they're comparing Drake now to Michael Jackson. Wow. And some people's like that is blasphemy to even mention them two together to compare. And I was like, I don't think that's I blasphemy. I don't think that's blasphemy. I think Drake's had an incredible run. I, I think you can put him up next to a lot of you know. I think he's earned the right to be argued against Michael Jackson. He still loses. But he's earned the right to ha- be have it talked about. Well, you know, it's, it's it's different too because like when when Michael came out with those albums, like I said, I was DJing when Thriller came out, and we were mm. playing off the wall still. But it was like, what was that? What was that? What was that? That was your. That was the. I'm gonna save this one till twelve forty five. Oh, man, you couldn't go wrong with Michael. You know what I mean? And it was, but it was also too like you gotta understand like we we're in like an hour from San Francisco or Oakland when I first started DJing, so we're. There's like people from all over. There's like black people from San Jose and Oakland and stuff up there, but there's a lot of white people from all over too. So it was kind of like a little ro- racial. I remember when we first started DJing, sometimes they were almost like, "You're playing too much black music or something." You know what I mean? I don't mm-hmm. know what they how they said it or whatever, but like you know, 
and like but it was pretty soon it just like that didn't last long you know what i mean like pretty much pretty soon then hip-hop just became universal but there was that time at first where it was like kind of like and i dj'd at a new wave club it was like 18 and under club and i i didn't really i played like the time and prince was yeah. out i was djing purple rain was out bro like the albums that were out when i was djing right then like, it's crazy how they've aged oof. what did it when you Some were playing shit didn't age <laughs> right a lot of I, shit right aged, I, I, I'd be wanting to know about those, but then nobody gonna. <laughs> I was like, "What are those? What are those songs that didn't work?" We'll make an obscure uh, YouTube uh, show just for those, Let's right? Make for a sure. New way to do the show. The, uh, the seaside, like not yeah. the beast, not the second single, <laughs> the third single that didn't necessarily the, work. The bombs, the no <laughs> right. hit wonders, the no right. hits, yeah. the attempts. <laughs> but I owe it all to DJing. You know what I mean? Like I learned how to like. Uh, I think know what was good. You know, it was just see how people reacted to records. So that mm -hmm. made me like a. a it gave me like my A&R like uh, skills. For like sure. that's the best training, you know. And I DJed for a long time, man. Like, you know, and I did like them funky little dances and parties at college. And then when I came back to LA, I started doing, there was an underground club scene that was going on. And at, at first I wasn't plugged in with nobody. And then I got plugged in with the hot shit. And I'm mm. DJing like heavy D release parties and like Damn, you know, at Parkview right. Plaza, like DJing for like thousand people. Like I had a little run, you know, I did, um, I did those TV shows. I did the Fresh Prince of Bel Air studio audience. I did Will Smith's first wedding. I did a lot of parties for uh, Wesley Snipes. He liked dance hall. <laughs> <laughs> and no one else really, there were very few DJs that played dance hall. Oh, yeah. You you knew the dance hall like that? And when was this? When was this Wesley Snipes 90s. dance hall phase? 90s. Oh, okay. 90s. When I worked for Def Jam and all that era around there, right before then, yeah. What was the Def Jam era like in the 90s? It was lit. Was it stressful? Was it fun? Was it, it was everything, huh? Yeah, it was all the above. <laughs> it was all that. We were just young, having fun, man. You know, like I, I wasn't, you know, when um, when Def Jam approached me, I was working for John Singleton. Okay. And uh, I want you to understand, like I was managing the far side. Yeah. And I was managing Coolio. Okay. But Coolio hadn't even come out yet. Mm. And the far side was like, you know, buzzing. Low. It wasn't like big, big, you know. It, it wasn't near as big as it got right. later. So I was still kind of small scale, so to speak. And and when I and that's when I met Def Jam, and they were like, um, my attorney was like, "Tell me you want your own label." And so that led to me getting my own label. You know what I mean? So. Mm -hmm. It just all, but it all came. Wait, you told you told Def Jam you wanted your own label, and I was like, all right, yeah. Oh, okay. And when I didn't, I didn't think they were gonna do it, but my attorney said they'll give it to you. But it was also too when, like, a label was like a glorified production deal. So like, I had a couple points on the record. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But you know, I I, I did very well for them. I had Rodham Warren G. Uh, I I turned them on to Domino that was uh, out here uh, on an independent label. Uh, uh, Montel Jordan, obviously, uh, the Dove Shack. Um, was on my label too that was other little thing all right out of, out of people that you had on your label or managed mm. whose musical process did you enjoy being around the most like just the way they created the vibe that they created when they were making music who had the who had the who had the vibe that you wanted to be around the most that's a good question see nobody asked that question cool that's a good question um <laughs> You know, the far side's process was like straining. Like you, you know, the four personalities, the crazy uh, producer. It's like a lot of drama. Like I'm over here, the manager. Like this doesn't make sense. Like the studio time is booked. Why are we over here like jerking off? You know what I mean? <laughs> because that's what we do. We're creatives. We're very, very creative. You know, so it's like kind of like I was always the kind of guy that just kind of laid back. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It was like tried to make an environment for people to be creative and not like get too wrapped, try to like put my imprint onto what other people, just find creative people and let them do their thing. You know right. what I mean? For sure. I mean, you know. Um, That's what I'm asking. Whose thing did you just enjoy being around more than more so than other people's? Like it don't sound like it was far side. <laughs> no, nah, I mean, I had a lot of fun with Coolio. You know, okay. he liked to smoke. 
I can see that. Coolio yeah. seems like his 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 um, musical making process is uh, fun. Far Side is like a boom bap beat, like boom bap rappers. So like they're very intricate with their rhymes. They probably want to sit in the corner with a with a pin pad or some shit. Yeah, no, but that was just such an exciting time though when we were working on their project. So that was a lot of fun. You know okay. what I mean? There was a lot of yeah, energy yeah. and excitement there. You know what I mean? Coolio used to record a lot at Echo Sound, and sometimes a lot, a fair amount of time, Tupac would be in the other room. Mm-hmm. So that was really cool. And then if it wasn't Tupac, it might be somebody else cool. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So there was just two studios. And a lot of times it would be cool. So we hooked up a lot of people there. We had fun. There was a basketball uh, thing outside. You know what I mean? Um, you know, I, I I wasn't somebody that like even always went to the studio. Oh, you didn't spend you didn't spend a lot of time in the studio. Did you spend a lot of time in the studio? <laughs> I mean, I've been around the studio, like, uh, you know, when I met Warren G, when Dre was working on stuff for us for Poetic Justice, which mm-hmm. was, like, a really crucial time. I caught a lot of other, like, pretty, like, historic stuff Dre was working on. I mean, I've been around people like Rick Rubin, watch him in the studio. I mean, um, but, you know, it wasn't always my job to be in the studio, so I didn't always just, like, hang out all the time. I get it. Yeah. For sure. So, yeah. Coolio. I was more like, I was more like, stop by. Make sure everybody's still working. Yeah. Bro All right. One. You guys do. You, guys, Check, cool. you got something to play me. Right. Everything can, good? Can I hear some shit? You What's know what I mean? What y'all got? Yeah, I got yeah, you. No, 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 no. That's them studios. That's too long. Man. They be sitting around. That man, that should take too long. <laughs> yeah, I get it. <laughs> I'll check back in with y'all. Y'all, I'm going to let the creators create. Maybe that's to my detriment. Maybe I need to be in the studio. It could have been a little more hands on. Yeah, and still, I'm still getting busy. So what you hear? What you hear, Dre make? Keep your heads ringing. Well, Poetic Justice was in the same time period that he was working on um, finishing up Snoop's album, mm. Doggy first, style? first album. Okay. So that's probably see the Chronics already come out, right? I know that we couldn't get a Snoop song for Poetic Justice because Doggy Style hadn't come out yet. I understand these. I, I remember it certain, you know. Yo. And, and the Wikipedia thing, you got to be careful because sometimes, it's like I said, when I'm talking about might have happened before what the release. Yeah, it came whatever. out in 93, but, but, right, but right. it happened in 91. Right, right, right. Yeah, right, I agree. Right. But um, we couldn't get a Snoop song because there had been a lot of Snoop things and, and Snoop's first album was about to be like, the, was the most anticipated rap album. Of all time, yeah, right. it was the the vibe like at that time. It was heavy. The vibe was heavy. The buzz was one eight seven because one eight seven it just fucked everybody up. Damn, I was still watching Sesame Street. I didn't know. I was DJing with that one eight seven, and that shit was oof, murderous. That shit was crazy. With the club energy just went stupid in in LA for sure. I also remember playing that at like on the set of the Fresh Prince show. Yeah, for some reason, yeah. Did you get in trouble? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like they got. I feel like they had like curse words. They loved me, yeah. Like curse word restrictions on the Fresh Prince. But I wasn't on the air. Right, you but, was you was the studio audience. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So, so you had. I heard. You know, it's funny. That's dope. That I found out that you were the DJ on Fresh Prince because when they did the Fresh Prince reunion episode, they talked about how it was like a party every time they filmed on the Fresh Prince. I need to get that clip. Boy, boy, for for sure, it, yeah. it's on. It's on HBO. Yeah, it was yep. a. It was a party, and and you know what? It'd be cool as I know that I could get some of them to say you to talk about it too. You know, interview because yeah, we had a lot of fun. You know, um, and I did like three or four seasons. I did like from the. I didn't do the pilot, but I did the first show for like four seasons or something. I did, you know, and then I started to get kind of busy, and I started. Um, my man Mike, who was doing sound for me, just started like filling in. Yeah, <laughs> that's hard. <laughs> I know, and then and then when I left the show, they just put him on for like a season. Oh, okay. Yeah, Mike do it. Yeah. So he did the job though. He got it done. Mike's brother is Mike's talented guy, and and his brother is kind of famous. He worked with the Beastie Boys and stuff. Money Mark. Nice. Yeah. I, I thought you were gonna say Warren G when I asked you who was your favorite vibe to be around. It was fun to be with Warren, but uh, uh. Warren would flake out on studio sessions and shit about everything. But we did have fun. We did have fun. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> you can hear in his music that he flaked out on sessions sometimes. I just remember. I remember Nate, Nate was in the studio. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> I remember, okay, Sylvia Rohn, super powerful executive in the industry, right? Hired, calls me. Great. 
hires my client Warren G to do a remix for some new artist for her first single. Uh, she's called Brandy. So that's How Can I Be Down. Oh, uh, shit. And Warren... Uh, he got her to do what on it? He, it was a, Warren was supposed to do what? A, re, a remix. Oh, shit. A Warren G, I Want to Be Down remix? Ten racks, too. And, Damn. Um, in the 90s? Yeah, I know. And, um, but, and, and so anyway... The day the studio was booked, I couldn't reach Warren. I couldn't reach Warren. Finally, I reached him through some kind of way. And he was like running around with the twins. He was all fucked up. And he was like. The twins that got the tickle go around and around? Yeah. Okay. And he was like, I said, dude, you're not supposed to be at the studio doing the brandy thing. And he was like, yeah, that beat's too dope. I got to give that to the twins. I can't do it. What in the fuck? <laughs> so Sylvia Rowe was all pissed off at me. <laughs> What in the fuck? That beat is yeah, too Arnold dope. Still I gotta you give up. it to the twins. Sylvia Rowan was all pissed off at me after that. He wanted to give it to Maniac. Waniac. Waniac. Sorry, Waniac. Sorry, I just I only know them from yeah. round and round. <laughs> that shit is crazy. Yeah. Warren would have slid on that too. It, yeah. I, I mean, want to be was, down. Was... That's his lingo too. That's some G funk ass lingo. He want to be down. Unknown story. That's fucking wild. Yeah. <laughs> so uh yeah. That's the studio with Warren. <laughs> <laughs> Another question. Yeah. So before we started rolling, yeah. You couldn't stop talking about Lil Nas X. <laughs> yo, he was like, yo, have y'all listened to that Lil Nas X though? <laughs> okay, look. My hip hop reputation might be soiled and ruined after hey, this nah, podcast. Listen. But- I, 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 think, I, I, yeah. I'll co-sign you, bro. After yeah. old, first on Old Town Road was an undeniable snap, slap, slap, right? Slap, right, right, right. right. Number for, longest number one running song ever, right? Beat slap everything, right? Ever. And then, at, but I feel like after that, yeah, he started giving us good music. Pantini or whatever. All Panini. 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 Panini was dope. <laughs> and then I feel like this this little motherfucker he strategically got like. His gayer mar- and gayer on the each boy, song. Boy, did he? Yeah, his marketing. Intentionally, his marketing is is some next level shit or whatever. I right. Think too. Yeah. No, I mean like, I'm not over here to talk about him pushing the gay agenda or not pushing the gay agenda or the industry pushing the gay agenda or not pushing the gay agenda. That doesn't really interest me. But I think it's I just cool. listened to his music. I just listened to the album today. You know, I'm, I'm not really fucking with his videos, but right, I, I get it. <laughs> I, but I watched. I listened to his album today, and I undeniably felt like it was a better album than Donda. Um, and you know, I feel like it's gonna have. I, I made a prediction that in a year's time, it'll have more streams than Certified Lover Boy. So I, I, I'm down to bet. You say it. I take that bet. <laughs> Let's bet. I bet you. Let's I bet. bet you that Lil Nas X. Will not have a song. Drake will have a song that streams higher. I'm about the whole album. Oh, versus the whole album. We're just gonna count the whole album numbers. Oh yeah. Oh, that's easy win for Drake. Drake gets minimum twenty five million a song. Okay. Okay. Bet's on. I don't know what we're betting, but <laughs> I accept. Bet the house. I'll get two houses. I mean, I. I you know, I, I, I was saying, man, I think Certified Lover Boy is good, but I think I think in a way it's a plateau for Drake. I don't think there's a lot of hits on there. I think it's a nice, cohesive body of work, and there's mm-hmm. good songs on there. But I don't think he has the hits. You think this has. is this is the part where Drake goes like this? That might not be his trajectory. I'm a Drake fan. I think he's talented. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm, an, I'm not trying to count him out. I didn't expect him to be out. I was just kind of like... This might be unpopular, but I was just a little bored with Certified Lover Boy. Have we heard the best Drake song we're gonna hear? Maybe. Because this is t- a young this is a young man's sport, man. It's true. Typically, I um, unless you find your spot, like like you can't compare what Jay Z's been doing for like the last couple of years to like Reasonable Doubt. Right. We have heard the best Jay Z song we're gonna hear. Right. For sure. I I think Nas deserves a lot of props for having resilience, and I think you know. He's making some good music currently. The, I the, the think, Hit Boy projects. Are listen, like, Nas see, by keeping with like doing shit like that. Nas right? new shit slaps hard, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, everybody here, that young energy. For sure. Everybody who's listening to him loves it. Yeah. But we have also heard the best Nas song we're gonna hear. But I, but but for me, I'm taking Nas. I'm taking songs off a lot of songs off the album, put them in playlists. Yeah. That's how I judge shit. Yeah, absolutely. 
Ooh, that's what I wanted to talk to you about because you're in the music industry. I'm yeah. so glad you say that. Okay. You said that. Playlist. Playlisting. How do you feel about the um, the distribution of music right now? Like, like an artist, an artist needs to um, get on these playlists now. Whereas ten years ago, it's you like need the, to the, the ten years ago. Radio. You, it's ten, like it's the new radio. But right. but after the radio, it was blogs. You got on the blogs, then your song could get popping without sure. the radio. You know what I mean? Right. But now you got to have them playlists. And you can't before, have and blogs don't matter and anymore. And before the after the blogs, the playlists were more open. Right. They didn't. The, the labels didn't have the stranglehold on the blogs that they have now. Somebody told me I don't know who said this quote, but they said the biggest mistake the music industry made was not cutting a deal with Napster. Right. They should have cashed Napster out. They would own all music still. Yeah, no, it was a really dumb time in the industry because it was like, instead of embracing this technology, like you see, like with streaming, like you don't have to manufacture a record. You don't have to like ship it out. And if it doesn't sell, take a return. Yeah. Like, yeah, okay, you know, it's a lot less you're making per a stream than what you sold a CD for. It's a whole lot less more work. It's a lot less money you have to spend to, right, to do all that. And Never before in the history of music did you really get paid like every time somebody listens to something. Like mm -hmm. before you buy the album, it's a one-time fee, and that's it. But now they every don't... single time they listen, you can right. monetize and, and, it, and it adds up. So I'm saying like the, the major labels are making more money than ever from the streaming. They could have been, they could have um, embraced it from the beginning. Wait, they're making more money than they ever made? Yeah. I thought they were hurt. No. Oh. They were hurt for a second. Were they hurt for a second before they understood yeah. the with the game where they were playing? And then they bought the machine over there. That makes sense. Yeah, no, they're killing it. The streaming is, is good to them. I bet. Yeah, the streaming is good to them. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, they, instead of embracing it, though, you know, they, they you know, they want to sue fans. You know. Right. The fuck? I mean, you know, I was, I, you I was on, I'm a fan. I was on Napster downloading everything. I thought that was the coolest shit ever. Oh, I evolved. I was on, Oh. My, my career depended on me evolving right. with right. downloading songs like Napster, then Right, I was still fucking Bear around Share. with I was still DJing at that time loosely on and off. I still dabbled with it, so I was collecting MP3s. Plus I was collecting MP3s for my, you know, music supervision work. At that time it was kinda like having the song, you know, could be necessary. You know, it wasn't like everything wasn't just out there like that. Right. Where you could just go to YouTube or go, you know, there was no Spotify or so, you know. Is there is is trash music at an all time high to you? Because you're a music supervisor, you always gotta listen to new stuff. So I'm sure you hear a lot of weak shit. Oh, I do. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, it's like there's a lot of good creative music coming out. Mm -hmm. But then also, then when you can't deal with anything that's signed to a major label or a publisher, and you're dealing with like more upcoming artists, and you get a lot of like kind of like okay everyone trying to sound like something else that's happening mm. you know what i mean I so the monotony it. is worse for you is the worst part for you like everybody sounds the same yeah there's a lot of one note things going on mm. you know since i was thinking about dj and i was thinking about how there's like a lot of one note djs now like they're really good at maybe doing what this is mm -hmm. but they can't go outside of that and before like to be a good dj you would have to like rock different genres and stuff you know what i mean this is kind of a lost art. And are you saying, so that's how artists are? Yeah, I think there's, well, there's a lot of like mimicking and copying. I mean, it's just like, you know, like if some female rappers become hot and, you know, they're talking some, you know, very sexual stuff, then it's going to be like a lot of like female rappers come out talking sexual That is, shit. that is. Or if there's going to be, if it's like, you know, a trapped out kind of R&B player, mm -hmm. gangster R&B thing that, lot of that you know what i mean or if it's mm -hmm. like you know i smoked my dead ops and you know i just got out of jail there's gonna be a lot of that you know what i mean so people are reacting to what's popular and then they're they're mimicking it you know what i mean so it's understandable it's nothing new it's mm -hmm. and it's been going on since the beginning of time but now there's just so much more opportunity for people to put out music so it's trash at all time high possibly because anybody can make a decent record now and get it out 
and, 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 and try to promote it. Even more people can make a horrible record and put it out. That too. <laughs> but it's also so much easier. Like back in the day, like imagine like just getting in the studio was like a big deal and really expensive. And now everyone's got some shit in their garage and they're cranking out like quality enough stuff where you could just like load it right up to Spotify. You right. know what I mean? Like that's like just a radical. So that's just up to how many people are making music. And a lot of it is decent mm -hmm. or good. It's just so much flooded with good music. The great music is, you know, you know. But I think there's a lot of great music coming out right now, you know. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And then, so like, good music will be at an all-time high too because you're making it a lot easier for creatives mm. to not mm. have like can just put their stuff out to their fans. Like that process is a lot easier, mm. so they can spend a whole lot more time creating. And so, like, good right. music is is. Like, there's more good music, you know what I mean? As well as more trash music, because there's just a shit ton more music. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it, it's. I also think that the trends in music aren't the greatest, you know, in some of the, like, the things that people are really, like, like, the kind of, like, more popular, like, kind of, like, you know, things that, like, the formulatic kind of, like, hip-hop kind of things are, like, a little tired, you know what I mean? Some of it, you know. Hey, does anybody get shot in White Boy on Crenshaw? It's a documentary. I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> you got a story about how the homie got shot in the hood? Because you was in the hood, so I want to know. If, do you have any of those stories? Or you just was able to stay away from that the whole time? My story is kind of about a white boy who grew up in an all black neighborhood and it rubbed off on him in like a really positive way and he he soaked up the vibes and uh, it, it made him a lot cooler than he was and, and it, it influenced his music taste a lot for sure and uh he was able to kind of pass that on and help a bunch of artists come get their come out and and work on a lot of movies and tv shows and you know i'm working on snowfall right now for a while and uh uh, a gang of shit. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So you know, able but and, and and you know, I I'm in as people know, I'm in I'm in Crenshaw every day hanging out at the coffee shop, you know, and, and, and talking to artists and trying to help artists and you know what I mean? And yeah. give back to the community how I can, you know what I mean, so to speak, you know. Mm -hmm. so, so that's kinda what the story's about. Might you know, there might be some gunplay in there. There might be a few, you know, try to, you know, Get a got to have a gun on the cover of any movie poster, right? If it's based on Crenshaw, apparently. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. That shit would be hard. Hey, so when you're not working, are you listening to music? Not always. Right. Do you like, when you're riding in the car sometimes, do you just like silence? Or do you just like, you like, you a podcaster? All of the above. Yeah, I feel like it depends on the day. All of the above, yeah. Silent in the car. I usually have some kind of audio playing, unless mm -hmm. I'm on the phone. You be in traffic a lot. You know, lately, you know, I I spend a lot of time in the Crenshaw district, so I. You oh, know, so you staying close? Yeah, That's so my dope. moves are not that heavy in the whip, you know. So I I dip around here and there, and you know, you know, every once in a while I have to go to the other side of town or mm -hmm. somewhere or whatever, you know, but. Uh, so you gotta go to the other side of town. What's you doing in the car? You listening? You sitting in silence and thinking? You talking on the no, phone? No, no. I in the silence for me it might be if I'm not it, like if I'm like working out. I don't listen to music mm -hmm. uh, usually uh, and things like that. You know what I mean? Um, I gotta have music on the workouts, man. I don't make it as far if I don't. I'm not against music and workouts, but it's just like I don't like working out with headphones, and so I don't like if I'm at my own place and I can play music. I, but usually I just don't, you know what I mean? Like, and if I'm stretching or doing yoga, I don't usually fuck with music, you know, either, you know. But in a car, I usually have music. I'm yeah. usually bumping. And I might, or I might, I might fuck with a podcast if I got a good mm. podcast, you know. So being that you come from like the golden era of hip hop, mm. who are some of the new artists you like listening to, if any? Oh man, so many. Uh man from LA, we got so much shit. I mean, Ty Dollar Sign, Internet, I mean, you know, like Tyler the Creator's been making a lot of cool music. I mean, uh, uh I was just talking about what a fan I am on Pop Smoke's music. Mm -hmm. I think I think Cass would be in trouble, man, if he was still around, you know. Yeah. Um You know it's crazy, I wasn't the biggest 
fan of Pop Smoke music, mm. but I couldn't deny that he had a new style. Mm. And it was it was it was polished. Like you know what I'm saying? It was his own and you can and it was it was very clear to hear. My phone. Yeah, yeah. yeah um but I was like I don't like it that much, but I get why people like this. What a, what a, what about DJing wise? I mean, was it Oh, something? I still play it. Yeah, if, if people like it, it's not yeah, whack, right? Yeah, fuck it. Welcome to the party. I'll be lit to that shit, too, when it comes right, on. Right, um, Dior, Dior. Let's get it. Yeah, I like his shit. Um, you know, um, man, I, I have really eclectic taste. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, even though I was talking shit about Certified Lover Boy, I am a big Drake fan. You know, um, um, there's so many new artists I like. And when people ask me that question, I can never think of shit. You know what I mean? Mm. I mean, I like... I like ratchet shit. Like uh, I listen to like Kodak, Twenty One Savage. I like you know. Um, I like Twenty One Savage. Yeah, I like Twenty One, man. <laughs> yeah, that's like, my boy. Just, um, I mean, I like I like the production and stuff. But like some Travis Scott shit. I mean, like oof, you know, he's got some incredible shit. He's know? my favorite. He's my favorite musician that I can't understand. Mm. Like if I hear a Travis Scott song and I don't know none of the words, there's still a chance that I like that Travis Scott song. Mm. You know what I mean? There's a lot of mm. people. I might not like the song because I don't know what the fuck the song is about because I, I couldn't that, understand. I feel that way about Future. Yep. I, <laughs> I, but yeah, no, I love Future, but I like Travis Scott more. Yeah. It seems more. It seems more like a, a full song, like with the with instrumentation and shit. Mm. More so, as Future just seems like he's rapping over beats. Like you know what I mean? Right. Right. It's a. It's a. It's a more full experience when I'm listening to Travis Scott shit. He's dope. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, um, of course, Kendrick, SZA. I love that. I love that. That um, <clears throat> I love, like, if you were to look up SZA and maybe see, like, people, other artists, people. Oh, her. Oof. Her is my favorite. Oof. Yeah. Her is my favorite. I should have put her should have been first. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, I mean, there's a lot of good music coming out right now. You know what I mean? I mean, you know, and then people will just have good songs like YG will have a good song, or, yeah, or, yeah. Or, you know, whoever, you know what I mean? Like, you know, and, and so there's a lot of artists like that. I mean, I, I, I'm an ex DJ. So like, I mean, like, you know, um, he's trash as an artist, more or less. But like that CJ song, uh, Whoop -dee. Whoop, that should have me hyped. That should go. <laughs> yeah, right. that should go, you know. I mean, I, you know, I still, you know, I know a, when something's like like that obvious, you know, it's like usually I feel it, you know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah I, I just. And there's a, lot, there's a lot of times where I can recognize a song is is a slap, but mm -hmm. I don't like it. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? I'm mm -hmm. like, ah, nah, this ain't for me. But, oh, when I'm around people, this is for me for sure. Like, I never play a whole lot of money by beer, mm. not at a party. Right. You know what I mean? But at a party, yeah. you're probably going to hear that every well, single time. Well, <laughs> like, as a DJ, man, there was a lot of songs that I used to play, and it was just like I got tired of hearing them. Like, and, But you play them because people want to hear them. Right. But, but like on your own time, you're, you're on some other shit. You know what I For mean? For sure. Yeah, you're listening. You know, you're a DJ. You're like making your own mixtape. You know what I mean? You're like, I would never play I Just Want to Love You by Jay-Z. Give it to me on my own. I hear it Bro, so there are, much. There are so many records that in I life. that I burn out from all that time of DJing that like if I never hear again, I'm cool. You know what I mean? <laughs> Dog. Like, you know, you know. But there's so much music out there. You know, what I, mean? I realize that on verses. I realize yeah. that if I had never heard "Hot in Here" by Nelly ever again, uh, I would have been a okay. Uh, a okay. I like Nelly, but I could go the rest of my life without hearing "Hot in Here" again. Or yeah. By Usher. That goes for me for Nelly's whole catalog, but yeah, no, I could, but Nelly's whole catalog. I could put the trip tip drill video on silent. Ooh, um, but. yo, <laughs> he opened doors with that video. People didn't even like. Was Luke making music videos like that? No, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. You could look at that and open doors. That's one way to say it. Yeah, I mean, you know, you could also blame all the ills of society on him if you wanted to. I'm not going to. Do you think OnlyFans, if, if the tip yeah. drill video never came they out, would OnlyFans still be a thing? Never be an OnlyFans. So. No, T Nelly. They owe Nelly money. <laughs> OnlyFans owe Nelly a little bit of change. If it wasn't for the tip drill video, people wouldn't even know to put that stuff on the internet. Mm -mm. Because every boy in the whole world was talking about BET Uncut. Like, did you see BET Uncut? The tip drill video was on there. Who didn't wait up till 3 a.m. just to catch those videos? I only watched BET Uncut to see the tip drill video. 
I didn't even know BT Uncut was a thing before the Tip Drill video. What the fuck were they even playing on that channel that, before the Tip Drill video? BET porn? Like, softcore BET porn? Is that what was going on on BET Uncut? BET was always trash, man. They were so behind the thing. Like, MTV would be playing, like, more progressive, like, music than them. It was sad. You know what I mean? It was like... It was like all we got was BET, so we took it. Right, for yeah, sure. And they had some good things. It wasn't completely, you it's know. It's getting better now, though. Okay. BET is? Yeah, for sure. It's getting better. In a different way. Park? Um, no. Well, they, right, they no, have, 106 and Park was I like they, they have more the money. exception, not now the Now they world. have more money, right? Yeah. Yeah, I worked probably. on some shows on BET, and, and I'm not trying to slight that or anything. I was talking about when they were, like, programming videos back then. I was just saying, like, they didn't play a lot of rap. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It was like they, they'd be playing, like, really, like, you know, sm- smooth, <laughs> smooth jazz, like, type shit. Like, you know what I mean? It's just, like, there's this whole movement, super progressive movement of black music going on and, and right. the black entertainment network is like and BET just chooses not to acknowledge that presence yeah, like yeah. okay BET and play like a real watered down and version I, of right. it when they when they get involved in it or whatever yeah, right and then so. I think that led to like in the early 2000s Jay Z like boycotted the the BET awards like no nah, I'm not going to the BET awards and then everybody else started thinking the BET awards ain't cool well you, well, you know you know what's funny is like in in hindsight like. Oh, that's kind of lost because now it's just like, oh, BET had the videos because they did. They play a lot of cool old school videos and stuff, right? Especially mm-hmm. stuff that wasn't rap. And, you mm-hmm. know, and then when they finally started playing rap or whatever. But I mean, like, you know, it's just like that kind of like how whack they were kind of gets forgotten like oh. by a lot. But you know what I mean? Like yeah. history gets rewritten a lot. Like people are like, oh, that's the OG shit. That's the, yeah, yeah, kind of like and I'm not saying just them, but I'm just saying that that's an example of how a lot of that's why we got to tell the stories um you know get all the get the uh the real unfiltered for sure raw shit out there you know so the uh the culture stories aren't uh uh whitewashed you know what i'm saying yeah I, well in bet's defense mm-hmm. when i was in high school bet was what i was coming home to watch like when i was like i was like i gotta hurry up and make it home for 106 and park right no that wasn't even high school middle i think that was middle school for yeah. sure sorry Right, and like, and then you'll catch the no, other shows around. That was that like, was that was in the basement. Was I was legendary. Actually, that that was I was kind of talking about even before then. Yeah, I figured they were was, like really oh. slow, like when the hip hop shit was starting. You know what mm. I mean? To embrace, oh, uh, you talking about? Are you talking about like the the before that? Like the NWA scene was BT around when NWA came out? Yeah, and they weren't. Were they? Was NWA all over BT? Hell no. That's crazy. Maybe in the like, I remember. Un, maybe that had been like in the uncut or something. All the clips that I've seen seem to be on MTV. Yeah, MTV was way more edgy with mm. the hip hop they played, like the Yo MTV rap. Yeah, Yo, it was Yo MTV rap. They had a show on MTV that played rap. Other than that, MTV played a lot of white videos. Mm-hmm. They would that they wouldn't even play Rick James. I mean, Rick James sued them. <laughs> Michael Jackson was the only black artist that was getting play on mainstream regular MTV videos. Oh, there was so racist back then. It was really bad. And the and the rap was like this little segment, Yo MTV Raps. Kanye said he, yeah, Kanye said that Michael Jackson had trouble. Kanye told me that. He did. Michael Jackson did have trouble. And then, but like, um, he, but he didn't, but Rick James was talking, got mad at him over that because they fell out because he said he didn't stick up for him because, um, or was it Prince? He got mad at him over that. Confusing it, but anyway, uh, uh, Rick James sued MTV, they wouldn't play his videos. Mm. Did he win? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> so, speaking of but, raps, he, but, but, but I know that he, you know, he burned that chick with a crack pipe, though. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember that. that happened. That was a thing, that was a thing, that was sure. a thing. And he, but, but can I tell you how? <laughs> Can I tell you when I was in high school and when I was in junior high, how big Rick James was? How big was Rick James? Oh, my God. He was everything. Hip hop wasn't popping out here yet. There was no hip hop out here. It was about Rick James, bro. And the time. I remember when I was like in high school, like I snuck into some hood party. They were playing the time. That was like the hood shit when that came out. The time was what the hood was bumping. Like, hey. 
Cut that soft shit on. You better put some time on. The Times First album? <laughs> That's what it was like. Are you, was... are you familiar with the Times First album? I am familiar with the Times First album. I just didn't know what it Them songs are like 10 minutes long and shit. Every it was in there sweating. It was like little house parties with like the lights, you know, like going out, like people freaking. <laughs> just sweat dripping off the walls and shit, you know. What is the... Maybe I'm not familiar with the Times First album. What's no, the artwork look like? Uh... They're like standing in front of a thing. Like that had cool. I'm so cool. That had a uh, um. What was the song that uh? Get it up. It had um. Uh, yeah, like three big hits on it. Yeah, see, man, shit get lost. That yeah, that was the hood shit. You know, I'm sure. It's crazy because like all that whole album isn't even on the streaming service. Yo, songs from before are having trouble get like Aaliyah just got put on all streaming services. Right. Like what the fuck? Right. Why? Why? Who was in charge? Who dropped the ball on that one? And why did it take you till 2021 to pick it up? Her crazy manager. Uh, get it up. Nah, nah. You know that song? Let me see. Can I see the artwork? Yeah, that's the artwork right there. Let me see. Oh, I did have this album. I don't know the song. That probably came out like 81. I be knowing like when I'm in that section, like, okay, it's 80s time. Let me go. Let me go to my '80s section now. It's their and next then I'll album the stuff that kind of had the more known songs and stuff or whatever. But I mean, like I'm oh, saying, that okay. album. I mean, that album had three big hits for that time. But I see, looking at their top hits now, only "Get It Up" is from that album is is in their top mm. five biggest songs. But that album was the hood shit. You know, it was funk. I'm saying L.A. was was just off that funk mm. cameo. Oof. And then they just put the G in front of it, huh? That's why. That's why G. And Parliament, started. of course. Like people would play, like I said, Rick James. Like you can go to a house party, like I said, like one of those songs I could, I never want to hear again is "Flashlight" by Parliament. Like I I, I'm cool. Like you know what I mean? But like you know, George Clinton. Yeah, it was George <laughs> when Atomic Dog came out. Like that, I was DJing then. That was over. Was gangsters fucking with Zap and Roger? Oh yeah, that started a fight at the house party. Nice. Oh, yeah. I put knew on it, more bounce. Put, put, put on more bounce. You want to see some motherfuckers scrap? More bounce. <laughs> one way, too. Okay, one way. Ooh. I mean, I'm saying it was like that was the, you know, that was the real LA shit. And then, and then, you know, and then, and then there was the techno. There was the Egyptian lover thing. That was real. Mm, that was a phase. <laughs> Egyptian lover. That's tight. Arabian Prince. Twilight 22. Uh, that really fast shit. Egyptian number. Yeah. So what was that transition like going from that to NWA? Right. Well, I was in the Bay. But, I mean, I was buying, getting all them records and everything. You know what I mean? It was kind of like they were kind of coming out at the same time. When did you come to L.A.? Back to L.A.? Well, I yeah, came back from for, college. I came back for summers and everything. Yeah, yeah. So I wasn't like, completely out of touch. Okay. But, like, uh, I think 87, 88, I came back. Oh, so you was, but I started DJing in '82. Right. So when NWA dropped, you was in the we Bay. We had wood or... pagers and shit. You were in the yeah, Bay yeah. or in LA? <laughs> when NWA dropped, I was in the Bay. I had the 12 inch. I remember. I remember we was we was we was tripping out on the artwork and everything. We're looking, the fuck is you drinking eight balls and everything? <laughs> <laughs> after um, Jerry curls and shit. Did party stop for a second after the Rodney King rides, or did they keep going? The LA right, ninety two. Man, that did was, the city shut down for? for I was managing for a the far side mm-hmm. at that time. And they was out there looting and everything too. I was I lived on Sunset and like Highland, and the tanks were rolling down Sunset. That was a crazy time. And I mean, when I went to visit my parents, man, and in, in, in you know in Crenshaw, man, that was really wild. All their neighbors were worried for them and everything. And they lived, you know, lived right up on that hill, and you could just see the whole city burning and everything you know there weren't no parties right then no, hell no there was a curfew oh shit damn and your parents was white yeah that's exactly. probably a scary time to be over there for right. sure right stay the fuck in the house yeah all the neighbors was looking out for them you know because they lived there forever you right know I mean? for sure but yeah there was a scary time to be white over there that's crazy yeah i, I was working for cube at that time too that was right over by uh where they pulled the dude out the truck off of Florence. On Florence, yeah. Florence and Western. Wherever that was, the, uh, Cube's thing was by like Florence and Crenshaw, but 
down. He got his shit busted open, too. That was wrong. Yeah. He didn't well, deserve that. PJ Green was an ordinary guy who played by all the rules. Oh, man, this is another ticket. God damn it, I better pay this right away. Oh, he's giving me goddamn tickets. Those fuckers. Damn it. The goddamn police department. The mayor is a bitch. Oh, I just wish, just wish things be better for me. It's like, why, God? Why, God? P.J. Green is somebody. I'm a man. P.J. Green is a man. But one day, while microwaving a bowl of soup, the nuclear radiation fused the core of his being to a box of saltine crackers, giving him a range of cracker-related abilities. He became Saltine Man. In Ho- I was living in Hollywood at that time, like I said, on Sunset and Highland. So I wasn't really, you know, I wasn't tripping. All right. So I was watching a YouTube you did, and they was talking about um, good white rappers. And then you were saying that there's a few. And then, like, you don't want to discredit Eminem or anything, but, like, nobody's bumping Eminem. Right. And you know it's, you know what was crazy when I heard that? He told me the same shit like a month ago when we was talking about Kendrick was, Soul. See, great minds think alike. <laughs> no, because I was telling him I feel like Kendrick Lamar. Oh, I got it. I feel like Kendrick is Influence. Eminem if Eminem could say nigga. Uh, because I mean, like the way they bend words and do the wordplay shit and their Dr. Dre cosigns, like they bring the same thing to the table, but Kendrick is double because he says nigga. And then he he proved me wrong because Kendrick's songs have substance. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like Eminem was so shock value. He wasted his talent on the shock value. I agree. Like I agree. He was like, I gotta get somebody, I gotta get everybody to react to this shit right now. Do you know what is the dopest Eminem? What? The oldest Eminem you can find almost. The first one? The well, pre- he was like battle rapping pre- like, on Shady tapes. Oh, uh, like, before yeah. Dr. Dre. Yeah. Oh. Uh. Like raucous and and then kind of like the early stuff he did and that first album too maybe I think I think it's just like I think he's really talented mm-hmm. and 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 when he first came out I was like super into him and everything you know what I mean but because I just the, the lyrics and everything and his songs and it was just so funny you know what I mean it's like some re- <coughs> rewind shit you know what mm-hmm. I mean but after a while he just didn't make the kind of music I wanted to listen to. Irregardless of how talented he is as a rapper or whatever. So that's where my head was at. 
And that's I'm, why I say, like, it's not the kind of thing I hear people driving around bumping in the hood or anything. So but even that's, that, that's, what, that's why I was just saying that you don't hear people drive around bumping Eminem. Like, you know, that's that's what I meant. Like, but like for know. the for the numbers Eminem put up and the records he broke for when he when he had his run, he 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 should have songs that we play randomly in the car. You know what I mean? Exactly. But he doesn't because exactly. it was all shock value. Exactly. And like if he would have gave us, I feel like he would have gave us more of him instead of the shell of, because I feel like he gave mm. us a shell of him. Like he mentioned, right, char- like, like, like he mentioned he, characters in his life. Right. Like his, like his daughter like Stan. and his, and his you might, mom. You might listen to Stan if it came on. Right. With the Dido sample, right? Yeah, yeah. Like that's some more heartfelt shit or whatever. That, but, has, but that the, has the best odds as far right, as like right, one of his big the, songs. But all the gimmicky. Like, right. It, it just gets old. His music got, his, his music didn't age. It didn't. Bitch, I'm going to kill you. You don't want to fuck with me. Remember that song? Like, I don't have no desire to, like, ever. I mean, I think, I think he kind of. Even though it's dope. I think he kind of, like, gets off, too, on some of the, like, songs that he's on with, like, Dre. The one where he's, like, what's that song where he's, like, we burned down the house and, you know, whatever that shit. We're, oh, we're yeah. standing outside with the, the gas. With a can full of gas and a handful of matches. I still like found shit. out. Yeah. I mean, like, I. I, I, like I said, I, I, I think he's one of the best MCs, but I just don't really like his music, if that makes sense or whatever. Like, mm. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't really, he doesn't make the kind of music I like. It's just not really for me, you know, but I don't. I Is it just a different wave? Yeah, I wouldn't want to diss him. I got to, yeah, no, I'm not dissing him. I think. He's a goat. He definitely Agreed. Is. For sure. Agreed. I I be putting him in my top rapper sometimes. Sure. My top ten changes like every day. Like it depends Let, how. Give I feel me your top ten. My to- oh today's top ten. Yeah. Boom. Number one is Drake. Boom. Number two is Jay Z. Boom. Number three, that's easy. Um, fuck. Who is it? Come on, man. We gotta bust these out. Nah, man. I was just. It's, ten, 10 is a lot. Let's do five. Okay, thank God. Seems like 10. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to make it to 10. Um, maybe Wayne. Three is Weezy. Wayne. Okay. Um, Makes sense. Four. Shit. All time. Can I say Jay-Z twice? No. no. Just um, fuck. Definitely not. Kanye is Kanye. Kanye. And Are then, we talking about MCs or artists? They're the same thing to me. Cause like if you're if you're too good of an artist and not as good of an M- as an MC, so rap I don't want to care. So so, we, so does a rap group. Ooh, a rap group can count. Ooh, for sure. And uh, Andre three thousand could be number five. You only did four. Oh, nah. you put Kanye in there? Yeah, I put Kanye as number four. Oh, okay. He had he he his inf- his influence on the game is so is is ridiculous. Mine's easy, man. I go Biggie, mm. uh, Nas, Jay Z. Nas, Jay Z. Uh, Wait, you meant I'll, to say Biggie, Jay Z, Nas? But go ahead, keep going. Yeah, you're right. Biggie, Jay Z, Nas. Uh, <laughs> shit, I'll throw Kendrick. Ooh, up in that motherfucker. I didn't even put Kung Fu Kenny in yeah. my list. Um, I want to take blasphemy. Kanye out blasphemy. and put Kendrick Please. at number one or three. <laughs> But go ahead. <laughs> um, I was talking shit and I, and I paused. Huh? But I said, I said, Biggie, Jay Z, Nas, Kendrick. Suggestions from the peanut gallery. Damn, I want to redo my list. <laughs> go ahead. I mean, I kind of like Outcast. I kind of like that idea. Do you like Outcast or do you like Andre? I mean, I like Andre the best out of Outcast, but I like Outcast more than I like Andre solo. Mm. Mm. But it's kind of like apples and oranges. How can you, you know, that's like unfair. Mm-hmm. Never, we're comparing Big Boy and Andre to like, you know, that's why I'm saying like, I be feeling I'm like, kind of thinking like, if we go MCs too, there's people like Cube, Rakim, you know, that could go on my, definitely in my top 10, you know, um, uh, I smoke too much already. Man. I feel I that, bro. Smoke. You want to say your top five? Yeah, give us easy for me. Yeah. Uh, Jay Z is going to forever be the greatest rapper of all time. Okay, boom. Then it's Big. Thank you. Kendrick. Thank you. I have to put Drake in there. Oh, yeah, I'm not mad at that. Is uh, Lil Wayne. Okay. Mm. I could throw Drake in my list. Drake is undeniable, bro. I like tens because I give you enough room to throw in, you know. Five is a lot a of random. pressure. 
Old Man, I head. fucked that one up. <laughs> Start over. <laughs> no, I'm good. I'll leave it fucked up for now. Just know that list does not represent me or my <laughs> thoughts. <laughs> I do not stand by my list. Either. No, I know that there <laughs> is visual high. evidence. Are you rolling, man? What's up with that wood? I know that there's visual evidence of my blasphemous top five, but I'm here to say on the record that I never said that. It wasn't that bad. It was cool, but I didn't even have Kendrick on there. All right, this is what I wanted to say. Yeah, I got this. I got this theory in my head that I'm sure a lot of people will disagree with. Okay, but. UGK is like the bizarro world outcast. Uh. Whereas where Pimp C gives you everything you get from the song from Andre 3000 and Bum B gives you everything you get from music from it, the same as Big Boy. Yo, Bun B could be in my top 10. Yeah. Oh, wait. Bun B's nice. Over Pimp C? Yeah, I think he's a better MC. Ooh. And not just no hate on Pimp C. Pimp C's nice. Ooh. UGK's nice. I slept on UGK when they were early. I remember when I heard Pocket Full of Stones, but I didn't get it. I, I, you know, it was too early for me. But later, I was like, man, yo, Bun B is nice. Pimp C speaks to my soul. I be just hearing Bun B rapping. Nipsey, Hustle Nipsey's. is number one or four in my on my thing too. Nipsey definitely should get some kind of mention. yeah. He's number. I, Possibly. God, fuck this top five. <laughs> That's hard. Like a lot of people would say it was blasphemous that you didn't put Tupac in there. I get it. That was just before. That was before I was into hip hop heavy. It was. It was ninety seven. I was nine. Yeah. Like I wasn't into hip hop enough. I wasn't hit into hip hop deep enough to. Biggie make your top ten. I noticed he was quite missing out your top five. But... Yeah. Biggie's up there. I like Biggie rapping more. Then I like Tupac rapping, but I like what Tupac did for music more than I like what Biggie did for music. Not sonically, though. Like, I'm talking about personalities. Because Tupac, I felt like Tupac was the first person to give you different personality, different sides of him on a rap album. Like, everybody had their one character. Like, but Snoop was giving you this, like, Doggy Style Snoop was giving you the same Snoop but, but, the whole time. No, but whereas on. Tupac would have Hit Him Up and Bring This Guy Wait, Baby on, on the Snoop. same album. Definitely is probably in my top five. Definitely in my top ten. Snoop, this is what I got to say about Snoop, too. This is the thing. A lot of these guys got cut short, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I think if Pop Smoke wasn't dead, he should be on my list. But he don't have enough work, right? And some of these, Biggie, too, but he, for me, it don't matter with him. But a lot of these guys, their work was cut short and stuff, too, you know what I mean? But one thing about Snoop, man, and like Nas, too, both of them, how long they've been relevant. Yeah. Snoop put out Doggy Style, and then like 20 years later, he did like Rhythm and Gangster and shit. I mean, that had hits on it. Man. Right. He's a ridiculous. He's a, he, his, and his he's run still is relevant. Crazy. Right, for sure. He's like, he's been running. I don't know who's been running longer. Then who? Snoop. Oh. Only Nas. Snoop runs better. Yeah, I mean, I, Snoop's the most recognizable rap artist in the world. Everybody's yeah. grandma knows who That's Snoop true. is. Mm. In yep. China, Russia. Yeah, so, you know. And, he, I mean, yeah, man, Snoop's amazing. And what a great guy. Right? And he's just so positive. Man. Yeah, but what a great artist. He definitely deserves to be in the top tens, you know? For sure. Yeah. He's in my top ten, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he, he created. Like, he had, he had the most distinct flow of all time. He, you know... Man, that when he came out, he was so fresh. It, like a lot of people bit his shit. You know, it was that kind. Of, he was singing. How much of that credit would you give to Dre? How much percent? That's a good call. And, and, and my man Warren G deserves a lot of credit for just bringing Snoop into the picture. You know mm. what I mean? As well, like without Warren G, there's no Snoop. There's no Nate Dog. Like his contribution is so underrated. Do you mm. see that G Funk documentary? Nope. That I'm in. Nope. Oh man. Send me a link. Why do I watch it? Yeah, I think it's on YouTube Red or whatever. But it was originally. But anyway, it's um, it's a good doc. It's like there's a lot of good people in it. Snoop, Cube. Too short, you know, um, DOC, a bunch of people in it. But, but yeah, Warren, you know, Warren brought, um, you know, as everyone knows, Warren brought Snoop and, and, and brought Nate. And so without Warren, there's really no chronic. 
Mm. I mean, there's so much that didn't happen. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like, if you go like that. But I give Dre a lot of credit, too, because also because he was like the orchestrator. And I was around. I did watch him work in the studio for a while because I did hang out for a long time out there trying to get that song. Because first he took forever to deliver it. It was the, the Dog Pound song on there. Uh, that's on the Poetic, on the poetic Justice. Justice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and, then, um, and then after he finally delivered it, it, it was a Bobby Womack sample and the sample didn't clear. So then I had to go back and try to get him to like redo it. And he didn't really want to fuck with it. So that whole time he was working on, you know, all that other stuff. So I was like getting to see some monumental stuff and watching him work in the studio a little bit. And I saw how he just kind of orchestrated everything. Like people say, you know, sometimes dads make the beat or whatever and this kind of thing. But he's like the one that's like, you know, and that crazy like way mix the sonic thing that he had going on like mm -hmm. you know whatever he was doing and the way he was have his engineers i mean that shit was like his you know there was very few records that you could like play in your car that were like you know mind-blowing like those dre records you know they were yeah. on the sonic level of those records so yeah i mean and that production was so hard hitting it, it put snoop on another level when he came out but without Snoop's voice and and that and that in that really dope uh, you know um, delivery and flow that he had and and yeah. lyrics too, uh, you know it is for not really you know I mean I Damn. think there's only Damn. there's only so many like Dr. Dre raps that you can listen to over those beats before you just like you know you want to hear like Snoop and Nate and Corrupt he knows that too oh, that's, and that's why the, that's why he always has a ton of features oh yeah there's no Corrupt without Warren either so what you mean. He brought he did the same thing he did with Snoop with Corrupt. No, um, I think Snoop brought Corrupt. Snoop brought Corrupt. Right. I think that's right. Right. Yeah. That's hard. Who brought Daz? Right. There's so many songs. So Daz, you see what Daz see? don't get enough credit for making like yeah, all them yeah. beats. I fuck with I fuck with Daz. I fuck with Corrupt hard. Those are good dudes. I just seen him at Big Boy's party too, man. It was it was it was it was great to catch up. I really got to talk Corrupt. I really see Daz, but for a second. But I met Daz's kids and stuff. But good dudes, man. Always, always, uh, I, always uh, been around them a lot, and and it's always been real positive. Have you ever had to do a lot to get a sample cleared? When I say do a lot, I mean like extras, like beyond what your job was. Yeah, and sometimes they don't clear. Yeah, I know. So, like, yeah, what's yeah. the what what's the furthest oh, length a... you've ever gone to to get a sample cleared? Um. I mean, you know, that's the shit the lawyers do and shit. You know what I mean? You got, oh, okay. you got a sample clearance person and, you know. Nothing. <laughs> mm. I mean, I could tell you when we did Gangster's Paradise, mm -hmm. Barry Gordy took 75% of that publishing. Damn. <laughs> yeah, so Coolio, the producer, and the singer had to split the... Split 25%? Yeah. Barry cleaned up too, because that's a big song. Yeah. That's Didn't it win a Grammy? Yeah. Damn. That it, Grammy it the, is like a slap in the face too. It was it, the number it was the number one song. It was the number one song in the country that year. Like number one billboard, like the biggest song. And 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 we toured all over the world off that. It was trippy because like I usually didn't go on tour with the artists. Yeah, I didn't even hang in the studio either, right? But I mm -hmm. not, not too much. But I would go super. Yeah. But but I went on the um uh, some of the European leg of that. Gangsters Paradise tour it was trippy. We would go to these countries. It'd be like everything in the top ten was like in their language, and then Gangsters Paradise was in the top ten. <laughs> not only were there not rap songs in the top ten, there weren't even songs in English. <laughs> and it was like at that time, most countries didn't have their own rap music. Mm. They didn't have rap. They barely. They didn't have probably you know. Right for sure. Like the UK has a whole rap scene now. Right. I mean, there was rap in England and France and. It, but but when you but you're going to like smaller countries like mm. I said that don't speak English, it's just Coolio made it. Yeah, just like all <laughs> local music and Coolio. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, that song was powerful, man. I mean, you know, and uh, uh, all props to Stevie Wonder, right? Oh, that was a Stevie sample. Yeah, for yeah, sure. we got to perform with Stevie at, at the MTV Music Awards. Dion Cole told me that Stevie Wonder is a savage. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I've heard some crazy Stevie Wonder stories, but I don't know what's true and what's not. And none of them were really bad about Stevie or anything like that. Some of them were a little savage, though, you know, but they were they were some of them were just mad comical, too. You know, I, I think I heard that he doesn't know his lyrics to his songs and they have to, like, shoot them to him in his ear. Or no like shit. Like, I, I heard. Um, I don't know. man. I love Stevie, man. He's, you know, Deion Cole says Stevie Wonder took his bitch. I'm sure. Hey, hey. <laughs> there used to be an Eddie Murphy skit about about uh don't say nothing about Stevie Wonder. You know, that's so old, don't even know it, man. I and don't. Then, what is it? Tell me. He's just he's, my, he was just talking about my getting mad, like you can't say shit about Stevie Wonder. Oh. You can't talk <laughs> shit about Stevie Wonder. That's how I feel, man. I mean, who's who's got a better catalog than Stevie Wonder? You know, that's why I find motherfuckers talking about, oh, shit was better back in our day, like like heads like my age talking about you know they're talking about like bell bib the bow or some shit or like mm, shut up man pop pop <laughs> as pop as it gets <laughs> i mean if you're coming in here talking about like you know i want to hear some shit like otis redding or aretha franklin or right i'm be like okay you know what i mean like but i'm just saying like there's so much good music now like don't people, say poison don't say poison in that conversation <laughs> people, right people that are just like reminiscing over crisscross was the was right the time oh man where's my Where's my cat? I need my cash money or I need my Nelly or whatever. I mean, like, and, and all props to all that shit, you know. Definitely cash money gets props. But, hey, but you know, I'm just saying, if you're going to. Oh, what's up, Blue? Blue's the star of the podcast. Them eyes got the got the guy, the male dogs and the ladies on the podcast swooning up. Say that. Blue, show them. <laughs> show them, girl. <laughs> Why is the podcast called Mind Your Business? Mind Your Own Business? Yeah. Isn't that kind of like anti-like... Like... It's exactly what we're not doing, right? The Mind Your Own Business podcast, where we do everything besides mind our own business. Like, don't listen? It's a blatant contradiction. Oh. Right. For sure. Trying to get up in people's stories. Right. Fucked up. Fucked right. up. I didn't say that at the beginning. The magic of editing? Thank you. Evan. Shout out to Evan. Edit that. Put... This at the beginning, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so tell us what it was like working with John Singleton. Oh, man, that's a good question, man. Thank you for asking that. Man, I owe so much to John, man. He was such a cool cat, man, you know. And it's amazing because he had a lot of belief in me, you know. And it's like kind of like especially when he first, like, picked me to work on Poetic Justice I was a young guy. Like I said, I had the far side and Coolio, but Coolio hadn't even come out yet. In fact, crazy story, Coolio's vocals are in, in Poetic Justice, Tupac's playing his cousin's music and they're like Tupac's, they were Coolio's demos that hadn't come out yet. But, you know, his belief in me, man, was just so amazing. And, and I, you know, I, I delivered for him, I think, you know what I mean? You know, I, I, I brought some good stuff. Like, it's crazy the shit that we were touching when I was working with him at first because there was a brief time when I was working with John and then and then John got mad at me and then and didn't fuck with me for like ten years. And Why? Then, oh, we're gonna tell that whole story. And um and then John was like, you know, it was never anything really, and he got way over it. And then he he called me and said, Hey, I'm working on Fast and Furious 2. Do you wanna fuck with me? And I was like, Duh. You know, and um and then from then on I worked with him pretty much till he passed. You know, I did um I did um uh, Hustle and Flow, I did Four Brothers, I did um um snowfall um you know so yeah, a bunch of shit but why did he get mad at you it was over warren g you and warren are you and warren g still best friends to this day because you should be me and warren are good yeah oh okay for sure yeah yeah that's my dude he fucks with me too i fuck with him uh well warren um okay so when i met john he said, I want you to run my label, New Deal Records, and su music supervise my new film, Poetic Justice. Okay. Yes. You know, I'm working in the 60s for Cube at Street Knowledge. It's a big come up for me. I'm on the Sony lot. You know, nice. and I'm VP of New Deal Records. You know, I get a... Um, you, wear your new Deal's you did you wear your New Deal's record shirt every time you went out? 
No, I, I was going to say I had a Ford Explorer, but I had the Ford Explorer already. I had that when I was working for Cube. I had gotten when, my first check I ever got was the Far Side's publishing deal, and I went and got a, a Ford Explorer at Crenshaw Ford because I was driving like a Nissan. Before, you know, I was in a bucket before uh, that. You know, you pulling right? up in an Explorer. Oh, yeah, I was balled out, you know. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so John, uh, um, so that was a big come up for me to work, you know, over there, you know, at, at, at the at the Sony lot, you know what I mean, in Culver City and everything, and be learning about movies and working on movies. And we're meeting with people like Snoop, Suge, and um, uh, Dre about the soundtrack, you know, Babyface. We, we met with Usher. It was before, That was his first record he ever put out. He was a little fucking kid. I met Usher when he was like the, 12 or something. The out, well, that, was, that was an album before My Way, right? The first song ever put out, ever the first song Usher ever put out was on Poetic Justice soundtrack. What was it called? for? Oh, yeah. okay. We had a TLC song <laughs> I on there. Up. I was gonna say what was it called, but I was just looking at it. Yeah. So I was meet, you know, I was meeting with like, you know, and I'm John's guy. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? John, this is the guy who did Boys in the Hood. So I'm meeting motherfuckers like I mean everybody. You, you know shaking I mean? all the hands, you greasing all the palms, man. You know, Valeting. My, my shit is, you know. So it was amazing, man. It was exciting time, you know what I mean. So anyway, when I met, I'm I'm long winding the story, but that's good. So anyway, when when I met John, I was managing the forest. I was managing Coolio, and I said, John, he said, I want you to run my label and 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 music supervise public justice. I said, okay, well, you know, I'm managing these groups. You know, is that cool? And he said, yeah, I want to manage uh, groups too. We'll, we'll we'll start a management company. We'll be partners in. Boom. Okay. So, in the course of me working on Poetic Justice, there's a, a now pretty infamous story. It's been in some podcasts. You gotta listen to the uh, the Chris Lighty story. Genius. Uh, um, and um, um, so anyway, I go to the studio and Warren's like, "Hey, I got my own shit, cuz." And he's like, "We go out to my car and he plays me Indo Smoke, right?" In fact, I only but I only listened to it a little bit and I ejected. Mm-hmm. And Warren's looking at me crazy, like I'm some industry like motherfucker. I'm like, looking at you crazy, like you some kind of industry. Why you cut it off? Because I knew it was fire already. <laughs> my ears golden, cause I cause I knew I was like, this Hit. is heat. This is a slap. Exactly. Let's take it. Let me take it to the presses right now. I said we're gonna put this on the soundtrack. I'm gonna play this for John. Everything. He's looking at me like this. This white boy's talking shit. You know. Mm-hmm. I said, can I keep the tape? It was cassette. You know. I said, yeah, you can keep the tape. Whatever. So. Anyway, I played it for John. John loved it. We put the song on the soundtrack, and we started managing Warren. Okay. Really more on the auspicious of managing him, managing him as a producer. Okay. In fact, the Tupac song on the Poetic Justice soundtrack is a song that Warren produced. We put our client's song on the soundtrack. Of course. Right. Um, so I took those Indo Smoke I got like 50 Indo Smoke videos and I sent them out to my A list hip hop. Like people that worked at the Source magazine. And, yeah. Uh, right. And my homeboy, Baby Chris. Okay. Chris Lighty. Okay. You know who he is. I know Chris Lighty. Okay. Rest in peace to Chris Lighty. Thank you. Okay. So Chris calls me back and he goes, Yo, who's the guy in the third verse? Oh, that's Warren G. Dr. Dre's brother, Snoop's DJ, whatever, you know? Mm-hmm. Next thing I know, Russell Simmons is calling me. He want to sign Warren as an artist. That's so, hard. Right. So I go tell John, hey, Def Jam want to sign Warren. Nah, nah, I think we should sign him to, to New Deal. John, they're talking about like 300K. Our deals are like, six, set at like 60K or Right, right. Really for sure. I forget what it was. It was small. Shit, five times more. Shit. It was something crazy. Mm-hmm. And um, so I was like, ah, yeah, I want to do a new deal. So, so Def Jam's pressing me. I said, well, why don't you come out here and meet with us? So, ha! <laughs> this is a good story. Keep going. So, um, it's like a Friday or something. I call in, I call in sick, and they fly me out to New York, and uh, I meet with Russell and, and Lior. I'm in the pit of the Illuminati. <laughs> 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 right, so I meet with Russell and Lior and everything. Right, and uh, on a Friday, 
and I come back to work on a, on Monday. I come pull up to the Sony lot, but like John, man, John had his people. Somebody ratted me out. Oh, they knew about the meeting right when you touched back down, huh? Yeah, before I touched down, they said, uh, "Oh, your Paul was here and meeting with Def Jam." I didn't get a chance to talk to John about it, or and my whole just. Just, you know, my whole thing was I wasn't accepting anything from Def Jam. I was just like. You're just listening. Right. Which we kind of owe to our client. And I'm, yeah, sure John sure. Would, I'm sure John would admit now. You know what I mean? Or mm-hmm. Obviously, he wasn't mad at me. I did all that shit with him later. You know, he got way over it. But anyway. So, in fact, but John, you know, cocky, young, you know, youngest person ever nominated for a Best filmmaker at an Oscar? Right. Youngest person, first black? For sure. Ever? Right. He knows who he is. They need to they have the security guards in. Take me out the lot. Like, you can't, no, you can't take this Rolodex. Or, like, you know, it was that escorted off the Damn. lot shit. Watching what I take or whatever type of shit. Yeah, I got escorted off the lot. You know, Def Jam, that's when Def Jam gave me my label and everything. And, you know, then oh, so then you it. ended up taking the deal. Oh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it kind of worked out, you know. I don't want to say good for me. but It was more profitable. It was another big step. Yeah, for sure. I had my own label. It was through Def Jam. You yeah. Know, you know. I didn't know I was dealing with the devils, you know. but you know, I, didn't know I, was in, I didn't know I was in the Illuminati pit. But, you know. All right. So outside of the lyrics, I don't know nothing about your story, your connection with Montel Jordan. What did you, Dance what was you and Montel Jordan do? Well, I know. Oh, oh well, man, I'm sorry. Okay, back to the John Singleton thing, right? Yeah. So when we were, because it, it leads back to John Singleton. Man. So me and John, like later when we got back together, like 10 years later, we start, when he calls me and we're Fast and Furious too. And actually even on the way up to there, we would see each other out and we start talking. We'd be like, bro, look what we had our hands on. Because... Okay, I was managing Farside. Mm-hmm. I was managing Coolio. We had Warren. Um, we almost signed Nate Dog because he wasn't signed to Death Row yet, and we were trying to sign him. But we were, you know, he walked in one day. I just signed. You know what I mean? Like we were like that. You know that Damn. we didn't have the. You know, you definitely were in a position. Oh where man, you, we it had happened. And then and then Montel because John was a Kappa. Okay. And Montel was a Kappa. And one of his frat buddies was like, hey, there's this artist, you got to hear him. And John was like, yeah, Paul, check him out. Like, I'm, I'm I'm, with Tyra Banks hanging out or whatever. I'm making movies, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, That's what I got Paul for, okay? So this tall dude comes in and plays me this demo tape. Uh, it didn't have this is how we do it on it, but he was it was something he self-produced. It was like a Dre knockoff beat. It had mm. the like Moog thing and everything. On it. And he's singing about driving down Crenshaw. But he's singing. And I go, oh, this could work. I get it. Right at that time, it was, you know what's popping at that time? Mary J. Blige and Jodeci was what was popping. Oh, okay. Faith. It was hip hop R&B was popping. Mm. It was all East Coast. Right. That was, that was a New York thing. Oh, yeah. That shit was killing. You know, we had, we had, had the whole Death Row thing. But right then, right then, that right. was really, there was that was a little more wavy because it still gave it was you a little that, more wavy. That it was high bounce and then that right. R&B so, and so, melodic. So when I when I heard Montel, that was my vision was like, oh, this is a West Coast, um, uh, hip hop R and B thing. Mm-hmm. This will be our our shit. This will be our Joe to see Mary J. Blige kind of thing. Right. Mm. So even better story. So or better part of the story was so. I went to Def Jam, you know, because of the Warren thing and everything, got my deal. And then, but I didn't want to fuck with Montel because I had met him through John. So I didn't present him to Def Jam or anything like that. You didn't want to get in trouble again? I'm a loyal cat. I feel it. Yeah, John put me on, man. And I, you know, like he, like I felt bad about the way the whole thing went down. Like I didn't get a chance to talk to him to see what he was going to offer me. I kind of had to look out for my best interest and the artist's best interest and at least investigate, whatever, you know. But um, I'm a loyal dude. I felt bad about the way this shit played out. You know what I mean? And uh, I didn't want to make it worse. I didn't, you know, I felt, I, you know, I met him through John. But see, then, you know, Montel started calling me. He's like, John's not returning my calls. I'm like, well, John don't give a fuck about the music. Man. You know what I mean? Like, it, it's yeah. like a little hobby to him. 
I said, all right, man, you know, and I, I, I played his stuff for Def Jam and they, they were hyped and I, I took him out to New York, man, and he sang for like Russell and Andre Harrell and Chris Rock. At, at, I remember at a loft where Russell lived and they, they were geeked and he was, he was geek. Monte was geek, you know, so, so, you know, I got him his deal that, you know, he signed to PMP, my company under Def Jam and, uh, um, uh, that song was totally his idea. Um, he self kind of produced or had the, the idea for the sample. And then he had his homeboy, uh, this R&B producer, Cat O.G. Pierce, who, who was a real cool guy. Um, R.I.P. O.G. And he produced it. And then I had uh, this guy, Wino, who had produced a lot of Coolio's hits, like Hip Hop It Up, Beef Up the Drums and this and that. And, yeah. and then... Uh, uh, and then Def Jam uh, went to town with it, you know, on the promotion side and went crazy with it. And it's a, a classic to this day. Mm. And I'm in the video. I was in the video, but then shit got funny style and they cut me out. <laughs> because, you know, like I said, you know, I, I wouldn't join the Illuminati. Is that what happened? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly what happened. Fun I fact, this is how we do it is the first song I ever learned as a kid. Yeah, word, for real. Word, yeah. <laughs> so you've been shouting me out this whole time. Whole time. What's I've known Paul before I even knew Paul. You knew South Paul Central your whole Central life. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, and you know, I've been talking to Montel too recently. Shout out to him, man. And you know Drew Hill. Yeah, um, I do. I um, um, I managed these producers early on called the Co Stars, and the first record they ever got placed. Or uh, the first big record they ever got placed. One of their very earliest ones was um, on Cisco's album that had Thong song. Oh, just oh, just that song. Like that's a big song. No, they <laughs> didn't. They didn't produce Thong. You song. said it like it they was had just a out, They had a song on the Thong song album. Oh, okay. Which the made them a lot of money back then. Because if you had a song on an album that was a hit album, yeah, you used to make a lot of money back then. For sure, because it was about see. album sales, not right, about how right. much an individual no, song sold. Right, because there was no. If you like Thong song, you bought the album. Right, and everybody got paid. Mm. Yeah, that's beautiful. Of course, Thong Song made more because it was on the radio. Right, right, right. They got it. But so, yeah, so, um, yeah, so I knew them. Yeah, um, more, I, I, I met Cisco a few times. I didn't know them super well. But, yeah, I mean, pretty much like, you know, um, I mean, I remember when Puffy was passing out flyers. I've known him since then. I mean. Um, I asked if you knew Drew Hill because Drew Hill just put a video out like a day ago. And I swear to God. Two of them people are brand new. Like, I, like every time I see Drew Hill, it seems like they put a new new people in Drew Hill. Like, why Cisco don't just go solo and sing Drew Hill songs? Yeah, I, I, that, that's corny to me. That whole thing, like replacing members and stuff, almost like you know. But Drew Hill does it every time they make an Instagram video. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Drew Hill is like one of them groups I was talking about when people were talking about. Oh man, this shit ain't so dope now. Like, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You ain't no James Brown. Did you hear about um, Diddy and JD versus? Oh, yeah. And Diddy said, fuck that. I only want Dre. Jermaine can't fuck with me. Give me Dre. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, the, the verses are interesting. I ain't really watch them too deep, but but I fuck with the highlights a little bit. I, I, I loved seeing that uh, all the memes on that on that Jada kiss shit. That was, and you know, that was hilarious. And that was a nice little, like, ode to uh, hip hop. You know what I mean? Kind of a, like, yeah, I mean, come over here rapping over your your vocals and shit and everything at a battle. Come on, man. Well, maybe it's because the year we had, but now that Versus is at another level, I tune in live to every Versus that comes out. Like, I mad at you. it's the closest I have been to, like, screaming like I'm at a concert on some virtual shit. Like, the Jeezy and Gucci one, mm. I was like, oh, my God. Seems like a lot of people don't pick their best shit. Seems yeah. like, it seems and, like, and then it seems there's like the locks two. one because they're DJ. Back to DJing. Because they're DJ selector, selected the right shit and, like, and, and all manipulated their, the their right DJ way, right? was good. Like, you could tell they did shows with their DJ. You know what I mean? That is their touring and DJ. And the dip said DJ was trash. And the dip said DJ was trash. It feels like they just was like told their manager to just DJ that day. <laughs> well, you know, the other thing, too, is, like, some artists are, like, have hits, but, like, sometimes you got to get there live. Like, he started, like, a live freestyle or whatever. Like, everybody's not built for that. Like, Kiss is built for that, you know? You watch, so Cameron could have so done just, a better job than he did for sure, I know. Yeah, yeah. So you so you just watch the recaps of the verses? 
so far nothing's really impelled uh, me it compelled me to like sit through the whole verse so you missed the you missed the fat joe cash grab who'd he battle ja rule and he said you know, it at the I, end I, I too i don't like things where they bully on like handicapped kids and like you know like you know just like beating up the the underdog i mean who's the underdog in your head ja rule you're a crackhead <laughs> the fuck are you talking about? Jaru is the original Drake. He was the singer rapper. He made singer rappers. I think Ja Rule's trash. But I mean, look, I and think you, Fat I think Joe ja, has I, no hits. I think hold, lean, hold lean back. I think Ja Rule has That's not the end. I think Ja Rule has not <laughs> aged well. Nah, he's popping right now. Oh, his old shit with Ashanti, it goes up. That's not true. Okay. Or does that come from your Chris Lighty 50 Cent bias? Man, I mean, yes. when 50 Cent came out on that mixtape, <laughs> dissing, dissing them cats, that was the most exciting hip-hop moment I had in a while. I was like, this dude is spitting. And he was using all those sample beats and everything at that time. They were hella dope and everything. Like, yo, that shit was fun. And it was also, too, it was like, because it was like, 50 came out so hard right then. It was just kind of like that. Old, it was like there's always these artists that come out. Big Daddy Kane was one. Rakim was one. You know what I'm saying? 50 was one where they're like, everything before me is trash. Like all that old shit, I'm shitting on it. You know what I mean? Like, you know, and Ja Rule, like he got steamrolled under that. But I think, you know, it's kind of funny how 50 became so much of like what he was talking shit about Ja Rule, which I think was whack. But I, I to me, I just think that Ja Rule was like, um, like um like a decent songwriter and everything like that and all and everything like that but he just like annoying to me like that's just like that's just not something i would want to listen to but he got slaps though he for the radio he owned the radio before 50 but, cent but, said he wasn't cool and he just takes you back to that time and kills it yeah that time is What's not my that, that, that time man? that time for me is that time, that time for go. me is a low point damn that's crazy. I mean, like I was saying, when Fifty came out, I mean, you you guys have like Rough Riders around the air. I mean, I'm just I'm just saying for me that, that you know that like I think that that and was, I, I fuck with Fifty. Get Rich or Die Trying is my favorite rap album, right? Of all time, not my favorite rapper, not even in my top ten, but best rap album. Like, whew. If, even, it's, if it's not that, it's Good Kid, Mad City. I, I think that mixtape is even harder. The first mixtape that came out, like right, the Power of a Dollar. Mm, is harder what, the one where he's talking about the the one that has like the quran on it and everything like yeah. that quran. Mm -hmm. that shit Oof. to me that's hell the, no that's that was dopest that, it 50. wasn't clean enough it wasn't clean enough dre I mean, right I, get, I, under, dre. I understand that i understand but for me to him he was doper on that damn i just realized dre was behind both of my favorite albums it's 50 cent and get and good kid mass city Get Richard I Try and Good Kid Mad City. But you didn't even put Kendrick on any list, so you're you're like a fake Kendrick fan. I didn't that list don't count. <laughs> I reneged that list. I shun that list. I don't fuck with that list. Fuck that list. That if I see that list, I'm gonna beat that list up. Okay. I got a list for you. <laughs> Both you guys. Overrated rappers. Hmm. Overrated Come on, man. rappers. Let's, let's talk some yin yang. Damn. That would be a good sound bite, click bite. Clickbait. Who's a, who's an oh, overrated like rapper? Fuck that shit. Let's do it. Um, who is overrated? Who would I like to hear less of? What's the radio playing right now? Could be old or new. <laughs> of all time. Could be old or new. Let's keep it open. I mean, you know, I don't know. Mm. Jaru had his run of overrated. Right. Um, who? I'd be like, damn, that's just not good. But everybody says it's good. It's a lot of people, and I can't think of none of them. Fuck. Come on, Danny, help me. No. <laughs> Who you say? Who do I think is overrated? Oof. I don't want to say J. Cole, but his music I does, would kinda, fuck his that music does kind of put me to sleep. Damn, but, but I even like J. Cole's music, I like but J. Cole too. the way the world just sucks J. Cole's dick off right. is just too much yeah, for me. Like, I seen somebody say on Twitter today, J. Cole doing this show in sweats and Crocs is a ridiculous flex. No cap. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? 
he just had some black. It wasn't even fly Crocs. It was just regular black Crocs and gray sweats. It wasn't even fly. Like it was like I could see how somebody would say that if they like had because like Saweetie just came just was modeling some Hidden Valley Ranch Crocs that are coming out right, and I was like, <laughs> yo, that that looks like a bag right there. Like that's a flex, you know what I mean? But J Cole just put on some Crocs and went to perform his song. And that's it's a not a flex. What is the flex that I? I mean, I, I, I can make I, money. I like in Crocs? the concept of J Cole more than I like J Cole. Yeah, I get that, and I think I think that's. Um, I'd rather listen to Drake's hits. I was just saying this earlier. Uh, CLB, uh-huh. I didn't like it that much when I first listened to it. Oh, was that gonna happen to me? Because that was my reaction. And then those are usually my favorite albums when I don't like them at first, and then I listen to them again and they start getting better and better and better. Those usually be my favorite albums. But when I get what I want from an album when I first listen to it, I notice it don't have a big shelf life. Like, and J Cole does that to me every time. I know exactly mm-hmm. what J Cole songs are gonna sound like. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So I'm ready for it. He gave it to me. And that's me for four days. And then I never listened to it ever again. Mm. I know I'm not going back to Donda. Kanye. Kanye is way overrated. stupid overrated. Stupid overrated. Like, he might win the crown for overrated as right now. As a rapper now. or just insane artist as, as a whole? As an artist. Either one. Which pick your favorite. All at at this point, for show. Because he used to do crazy shit and back it up with the music. Right. And now he just does crazy shit and then Puts out gives us music. music. Yeah. Like, fuck, that shit weak as hell. Weak as hell. Yeah, Kanye. Kanye is the king of overrated hip hop. But I'm still wait I'm still I still give him a chance every time because Wiz Khalifa is overrated. I yes. just remember that yes. Cushion Orange Juice was a fucking classic. Yes. And then we never got anything good out of Wiz ever again. Black and but yellow. Cushion Orange highlight. Juice. Cushion Orange Juice was so good that we're waiting for that again and we still listen every time. Okay. That's 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 the vibes. Yeah. So it feels like I can't mention any dead rappers. That'd be like untasteful. Yeah, if you want to. I don't. <laughs> okay. Are we going to talk about the Karen Civil uh, mess? Right. And for the longest time, I felt like I knew Karen Civil. But once you told me her background, there's no way I actually know Karen Civil. Blue eyes. But yeah, she Blue. is in some shit right now. Like, why is she getting like Bill Cosby right now? Like, just stories just keep coming out about her. One person came forward, then they are. She must have pissed are. off somebody in the Illuminati. Duh, real <laughs> she shit. She must have fell out of favor with the Illuminati. Jesus Christ. And she's getting... She's getting it. She just steals it. So Karen Civil just takes everybody's money and then just... I mean, look, I think it, it's easy enough to probably find upset artists with anybody that does marketing or promotion. Mm-hmm. But I'm not trying to excuse the situation. She seems like she's kind of like... One of those people that might overcharge and then like under deliver for some clients. I could see that, you know, and then getting pissed for sure, you know. Right. I could see her like getting a check and ghosting on a motherfucker, you know what I mean? But because the, the shit, the most scandalous shit I heard was the lady from Haiti in the charity talking about. What is happening in ha- what happened in Haiti? Well, it's this long story, man. I, I, I listened to a long ass video uh, on YouTube about it. Anyway, she was involved in this charity. And uh, she signed on to be an ambassador, and she was supposed to provide X amount of dollars, and then she never did. But she went and did the photo shoot and was doing all the photo ops and posted all the photos mm. and then never ended up doing following through with them. So it seemed a little janky. They were pissed. So wait, did she take their money? Like, no. And she actually paid for, like, the photo shoot. Karen Civil? Yeah, but she signed an agreement that she was going to help provide this money, which was supposed to she was probably just going to do like a, a, a benefit or something, maybe. I don't know. I don't know if she did any benefits or anything like that, but they were saying. So she signed this agreement that she was going to be a sponsor, and so she was going to help provide this money to make a, a playground in Haiti. Mm. And they had already, this organization's already done a bunch of playgrounds. Oprah's came to visit them. They seem pretty legit, you know? And You think uh, she read the contract and saw a spokesperson instead of sponsor? Or she knew what the fuck she was up. Because it sounded like she did the job of a spokesperson. And they were I mean, well, where's the I, money I, I, Well, I, you know, I, mean, I can't believe that she's unsavvy enough 
to sign a contract that says she's going to provide funds and not understand she that's part of her agreement. Or, I mean, look, I haven't heard her side to the story. Certainly could be a thing. There could be two sides to the story. But it would just sound pretty damning because it was, it, you know, it was just like she was just talking about how she jumped in up for the photo ops, but then failed on doing any of the work. But then the pictures are all blasted over the Internet. Right. So she showed up. She showed up to prove that she did the work. But but then the work didn't happen. It sounds like she just didn't give him a check. Is that what happened? That's what it sounds like, right? They took a picture with a check. Oh. She said she had to print up a check. Oh. Yeah, like that. She like that. showed that she gave money, but never gave money. Oh, okay. I didn't know what. I thought she just took pictures being there. Yeah, that's kind of weak. Yeah, and the chick was bitching about too how that, like, she had all the kids and are wearing, like, civil life shirts. And she was wearing, like, she never wore, like, their charity's called whatever it's called. And, like, she never promoted the charity, but the whole deal was, like, for her to promote. <laughs> The charity or whatever. Yeah. So it just seemed kind of damning. Jesus Christ. What about one thing came out, or I guess in the clubhouse thing or whatever, where I guess there's some blogger they had read posted stories. They used to be friends with her, but they posted stories about people like Cameron or somebody, maybe Joyner Lucas or somebody saying that like they ripped her off. And she hacked his site and got that shit off or whatever. <laughs> she admitted to that, I guess. It's like, I took it down. And she admitted to that, right? Mm. Jesus Christ. That's gotta be illegal. Karen still Karen still was savage. She's savage. I don't want to fuck with her. Hey, everything I said about her, I did not mean fuck that. I don't know about the age. Yeah, I just thought I about this. Yeah. I do really like Karen Civil. Um I wouldn't want anything bad to ever happen I mean, to her or her reputation. Yeah, man. Let's talk about View Park Records. What's the what's the uh, so you're the founder of U Park Records, right? Well, there's three of us. Co-founder. Yeah, I'm a co-founder. You're a co. You definitely got a shout out Evan Washington. Right, know. and who's the third one? Uh, Chance Tanner. What's the vision? What y'all doing with this thing? What y'all doing with this platform? What am I? What did I sign up for? Oh, man. <laughs> you know, when we were talking about artists, I really like a lot. I forgot to mention Buddy. That's another. I, there, there's so many LA artists, you know. But uh, hey, they trying to cancel Buddy right now. Fuck that. Yeah, that's my little nigga. Yeah, yeah. Um, View Park Records, man, is a wave. It's a movement. You know, um, like I said, I'm really involved in this whole movement going on in, in Lamert Park. And, uh, you know, just like um, I've, Evan is somebody that I've been like um, working with and, and kind of, um, I don't want to overstep my bounds, but maybe mentoring a little bit, you know, especially in like this space, you know, because yeah. he does a lot of things, you know. And I was like, we always kind of laughed, talked about it. It was kind of like, I'm Andre Harrell and he's puffy. That's Ooh, hard. That's hard. That's, dope. that's very accurate. That's yeah. And, and, and Chance is uh, also, you know, um, you know, brought some financial uh, to the party and, and some tech aspects and things to the party. So it's a, it's, a, it's a, yeah, it's a swaggy three way, you know. But yeah, I'm, 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 you know, I'm just trying to support like Evan's creative vision because like he, He's around all this great stuff, and he's got a great eye. So I was like, okay, well, like let's let's do it like this. And and our vision is kind of like to do real artist friendly deals, and, um, and 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 focus a lot on sinks, uh, because that's you know an area that I have so much uh, expertise and knowledge and, and juice in, you know. And so we we focus in on a lot of sinks, and uh, and we're just looking for great creative artists of like different styles and. Uh, you know, some will be definitely out of the L.A. area and the, and the Crenshaw area, but we're not limited to that. You know, looking at an artist out of uh, Oklahoma or Texas the other day, uh, looking at a, um, uh, a Jamaican, um, half Jamaican artist out of D.C., did some like Latin stuff, looking at a, a, a bunch of artists from all over, you know. But um, um, the first record we put out uh, right now, first record we put out right now is called right now <laughs> <laughs> that shit is hard By i like Cody. the video too you, yeah that yeah. video cleans hell yeah, evan man evan's got the visuals going you know so like i said you know i'm the i'm the andre he's the puffy you know so shout out to our brother evan yeah big shout out to evan uh that's the, you know he helped make view park happen you know because it was like really uh it was an idea we kind of had and then you know he'll bring some money to the table and then and then he brought this this, uh, uh, we started working on a record, uh, Millie, Millie Motto. Uh, it's going to be our second release, and, and that's something that um, 
you know, was a real collective effort between me and Evan. It was an artist that was a friend of mine. Evan brought the song maker. The producer was, you know, a, 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 a friend of all of ours, uh, Animal. Uh, we hope to be like our Dr. Dre, so to speak. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, um, so that was a real collaboration. But while that song was getting, you know, developed and, and morphing a little bit, um, Evan brought in the uh, Kawudi record and the Right Now and uh, I'm just floored by it, you know. So we, we put that out. We think that's a great record. Uh, probably going to do some remixes to it. Definitely working on some syncs. Um, getting it on a lot of playlists right now. Trying to get that streaming up. The go hustle. Stream it, the the music hustle has changed so Ooh. much. Yeah. Right. Yeah. How can we get How can we get more internet content out of this song? That's the That's the goal when you're putting the song out, right? Yeah. I mean, I think the goal is how can you stand out, right? In 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 the sea of of a lot of releases, right? And a lot of artists. You know, if you're in that space, you know, right, what right, I mean? right. You know, that's that's the space we're in. So, you know, we're just trying to stand out. I think we have a really strong record, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So uh, I think we have a monster of a record. So um, we're just trying to put our foot in it, you know? We're just trying to uh, uh, leave no stone unturned, you know? And uh, uh, do the best job we can for the artist. You know, we're a small company, so we're somewhat limited in resources, but not in creativity, you know? So, but yeah, like, I mean, content's very important, you know what I mean? I'm trying to have something that's going to catch people's eye with all the noise you know through the noise get through the noise you know what i mean i feel the fuck out of that i'll be yeah. repping i'll be repping view park am i am i fraud all right let me let me explain to you my story tell me if i'm a fraud i think you should be producing records for view park very soon i'm sure right? i'm with it yeah yeah okay i got tracks i bet i want to hear them all right okay. so i'll be saying i'm from view park somebody tell me where i'm from i'll be saying oh. i'm from view park right okay. where i lived is on Slauson and Crenshaw. Ah. And if I say where I actually lived, it sounds like I'm telling people I'm from 6 0. Right. You know what I mean? And I'm not from 6 0. Right. That part. But <laughs> I spent all my time when I was growing up and becoming the character that I am today in View Park. Because, you know, I was like at Evan's house. I was like at Lamine's house. I was like, that's that's where sure. I hung out. You know sure, what I mean? Sure, I understand. So, like, when people are like, where are you from? That's your formative. Where are you from? I'll be like, I'm from View Park. And yeah. then, like, I'm always like, kinda, Maybe you should claim kind of. I'm kind of from Maybe View you should Park. claim your, your, your. Well, I mean, you know, that's very interesting you say that. It's not where I slept, but that's where I was. Right. I mean, Grandshaw and Slauson is pretty close to View Park, too. Also, geographically. I rode my bike there. I said, so I walked. Right, right. I close. did walk. I mean, before it, I had a car. It, it's, it, it, you know, this is the thing, too. It's like, it's funny. Like, I, I, I got catfished about a year or two ago. Uh, I had shrimp. Yeah, I met this girl on Tinder, and um, <laughs> and um, she wasn't. You know, I think they were old photos or whatever. But anyway, the part of the story is, um, she said she lived in Baldwin Hills. Mm -hmm. and I was like, wow. She lived in the jungles. <laughs> <laughs> See, if you're not really from LA, I would have been able to tell the story. But he, he cut through all that. Of course, oh, you at the very oh, you at the bottom of the hill. Nah, of, she lived at the very of top of the jungle, so I will get rid of that. But she was so close; <laughs> she could spit in the ball when hills. She could she could throw a paper plane in the ball when hills. But she was still in the jungle. She was still in the jungle. She was at the upper part of the hill. She was she was oh, she, she was, was at the she was at the top of the was, bottom of the hill. She was at the double catfish, right? She catfished where she lived, right? But Damn. she right, she was she was she was right there. But 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 it's very interesting what you say because like, you know, back in the day too, it was like the cats that, you know, were from the hood and stuff too, we were wearing wearing uh 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 alligator lacoste shirts and stuff. You know, yeah. like if you were like really, really gang banging, like you might be wearing khakis and but that was mean you were like taking your life at risk to walk around like that. So most people that civilians, all the normal people you, you know knew not I mean? to wear khakis. No, weren't dressing like that. You know, but so and, and the thing was like it wasn't really cool to be from the hood. As a, as as hard as that sounds to imagine like it wasn't something that people were like always promoting and this and that. So it was like, yeah, it's because motherfuckers in the '90s was getting popped for what you wore. Well, well, it's a lot of things, right? But I'm just saying, like, when you're talking to people and meeting people, I don't. There hadn't been. There wasn't the pride, as much pride of being from this community, 
as as came later when all the rap artists come out and start saying i'm from here i'm from there and everyone's like oh this, i'm from the, you know back then it was looked down there was on. no positive rep- representation it from was those looked areas. down to be from that neighborhood and every people almost kind of like i said you would front you would if you live there you know you was oh i live in baldwin if the jungles you live in baldwin hills if you live in crunch on slots you live in view park or whatever plus you know all these kind of things or whatever you know what i mean yeah and and yeah i'm from baldwin hills i lived right next to the jungles though funny like i'm in mm-hmm. the opposite of that like you know and and you know you know i had a lot of experiences in the jungles and stuff too but i lived in baldwin hills a, a block away but a world away too you know yeah and like you know when i came up with the white boy from crenshaw thing you know it was funny because yeah i could have said a white boy from baldwin hills but they don't have the ring or whatever yeah, and and it, it, baldwin hills part of the crenshaw district when you drive into my house there's a sign you're entering crenshaw you know the district or whatever so i mean like i have no problem saying it you know what i mean it's like it's true you know what i mean it's like i grew up in that neighborhood my whole life in in that whole area around there you know what i mean it, it is part of crenshaw so you know uh but yeah you know it's interesting you say that because you know now uh uh, uh you know i favor the crenshaw part though of course i'm not trying to act like i'm not from baldwin hills i'm, I'm i am i'm, I'm mm-hmm. from the dons you're claiming that you know it's like the whole you know the like, Dons is a it's bar, It's like though. L.A., Crenshaw, Baldwin Hills, the Dons, you know. Uh, you could even throw South Central in there or South L.A., you know, because it is part of that, too. The uppermost north part, but, you know. So you said I'm a fraud like that girl who's lived in the jungles and claimed Baldwin Hills. I got it, Paul. <laughs> I mean, you know, own up to, you know, I'm from 60 Hood, but I didn't bang. That's too much talking. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, Jesus Christ. I mean, you could say I'm from L.A. I grew up off Crenshaw. Uh, but every, that's, I don't have in the fact, View Park ring. In fact, ring. you know what? Okay, you don't, don't have the View Park ring. Paul says, fact, I am from You're from Crenshaw. From Actually, you're from Crenshaw, bro. Come and Slauson. Crenshaw and Slauson? You're from Crenshaw, Crenshaw, the way it's Man. defined now. Yeah, it's true. You're from Crenshaw. I am from Crenshaw. So, shit, that's, you know. Own it. Claim it. I mean, you know, Crenshaw's cool, man. Crenshaw's a beautiful community, man. We got Lamert, You know, we got uh, the Crenshaw and Slauson area. You know, I mean, you know, I, I, I don't know if the Slauson swap meet is considered that part. But Hell no. We, right, we got Ball, Western. right. We got Baldwin Hills and View Park area. That's part of Cren- Crenshaw's got a whole diversity to it. We got the jungles. You know, and we got we got all this little part that, that's Crenshaw. You know what I mean? Good and bad. You know what I mean? Good neighbors and bad neighbors. All getting gentrified now, but yeah. right. The jungle. That's funny. Legend has it that you lost your virginity to a chick in the jungle. It's true. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I was I was in them streets. I was in them streets. You know, I was hey. I was bucking around. I was fucking around. You know, I mean, it was like uh, uh, Baldwin Hills was kind of boring compared to you know what was going on down there. You know? <laughs> it was. <laughs> I was moving it was, around. <laughs> You it know. was some it was some action in the jungles. That's yeah, what's up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you were you were a young cat, you know, you moving around. I mean, you know, I, I, I was I was sheltered but I wasn't. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? In some regards. Hell yeah. You know what I mean? And it kinda of the best of both worlds too. Because I was I was seeing that and I was soaking that up. But then on my block, you know, we have very uh educated upper middle class black people who also decided to stay in the neighborhood, to stay in the black neighborhood. They weren't the black people that moved to West L.A. or the Valley or, you know, places like that. Or if they had enough money, Brentwood or something like that, you know, people stayed in Baldwin Hills. And, you know, there was some really, you know, um, Deacon Jones, NFL player, mm. lived next door to me, uh, 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 judges, black judges, black brain surgeons, you know. You know, so, you know, it's good. To, I think it's good for kids to see that, you know, and then I went to Venice High. You know, they took me out to schools. So that's why I say I was sheltered too. Like I wasn't the only white kid at Dorsey. So, you know, that changed my, my whole experience drastically. You know what I mean? That's hard. Yeah. The light up there is clicking means and we gotta sign the fuck out. Yeah, we I know we've been on for hours. For sure. Man. Hey Paul, it's like you. three park. Thank guys, you for so. coming through and minding your own business. Oh man. <laughs> Check out View Park Records, YouTube, where this podcast is. We got some great content. Check it out. I'll be on View Park Records because guess where I'm from, nigga? View Park. <laughs> Which is right next to Baldwin Hill. So I'm from View Park. Where you from, Danny? I'm from everywhere. But you can catch me on the Mind Your Own Business Podcast. <laughs>